Hello, everybody. Welcome once again. You're listening to the voice of Free Arcadia. And so happy to be back. It's almost been a year since I've recorded an episode. Uh, it's been 11 months almost to the day. It's a wonderful subject to come back to. It's one of the strongest subjects we could talk about in uh, the animated Liegeverse, a seminal work in the Liegeverse, uh, Space Captain, Space Pirate Captain Harlock. Joining us once again, we have Mercury Falcon or John. John, how are you doing? I am doing great. Last time we had you on, you hit 10K on YouTube, and now you're hitting 20K pretty soon, right? Yep. Uh, it's, it's been kind of a slow year, but my goal overall is 30K, and I'm hoping that like towards the end of the year, I can push that extra, push on another 10K. We'll see what happens. Hell yeah. Fume, come. Thank you for being a new guest on the Free Arcadia podcast. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Um, Glad to be on here. I'm honored that you invited me to be on this. And Fumecom also has a wonderful YouTube channel that you can find under the same name with a lot of great retro anime content. What's something they should check out of yours? Uh, I guess my Dragon Ball content, I guess. I mean, that's mm -hmm. pretty much how everyone knows me. Uh, but yeah, you know, I've got a few other things on there about like retro games and stuff like that. I pretty much just do whatever I want to when I have spare time and I also do streams on Twitch and the like, you know, a very cool. unique person on the Internet. I do things <laughs> that no one else does. Right, right. Uh, I did find you from uh, your uh, Budokai videos and you've done some really cool lost media work as well. So go check out Fumecom. And we all crunched uh, 42 episodes of Space Pirate Captain Harlock. Uh, so we could come together and take a pretty comprehensive look. We can't necessarily go episode by episode, but we do want to get as deep as we can and uh, maybe find something new in, in this really old work. Uh, and speaking of old, yes, 1978, uh, this came out. But before that was the original manga. And I don't want to get too bogged down in the manga. I'm thinking manga could probably have its own episode at some point. But uh, it's worth talking about created by Leiji Matsumoto, uh, originally published uh, by longtime publisher Akita Shoten. The manga actually differs quite a bit from the anime, and it really didn't have any conclusive ending. Uh, Fumekam, how do you feel about the manga? Have you gotten to read much of it at all? Uh, unfortunately, I have not. I do own all three volumes that came out a few years ago, the, the English volumes. I can't remember the mm -hmm. company that published them, but... Uh, Seven Seas. First few chapters. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, but I've only read the first few chapters of it. Not really enough to, uh, you know, be able to comment. To, yeah. Still some. <laughs> that's where you're going to get the most overlap, really, is in the beginning. It's funny because I'm in the same boat where uh, I had gotten volume one, but I'd never like read it or anything. I it just I had it on my shelf. Um, I have a lot of manga on my shelf that I've only like partially read or only just just started. Um, I'm more of an anime guy than a manga guy, but. Uh, I wound up getting the entirety of the manga because I heard through the grapevine that those classic releases from Seven Seas weren't selling very well. And I'm mm -hmm. oh, going to go out of print. Got to get them now. So <laughs> I, I bought them and I have all three volumes, but I have not gotten past the first couple chapters of Harlock. Well, I've gotten at least two thirds of the way through. I'm partial to the manga. It seems that that ends up being the case with a lot of things. Uh, Queen Queen Melania was a big example of that, but it's not as big of a difference between Queen Melania's manga and the movie as it is with this show and the manga. It, it's definitely good stuff. And uh, yeah, once I bought the first volume, I was like, I have to have them all. The manga is beautifully drawn. We'll talk about some overlap there and some differences as we go on. Uh, the anime, though, was produced by Toei Animation and directed, most notably, really, I think, of the entire production staff is Rintaro of Studio Madhouse fame, uh, real name Shigeyuki Hayashi. And you guys can let me know if I'm butchering any of these too badly. He would go on to direct the Galaxy Express 3.9 movies, which that was my entry point to the Liegeverse. I think that's kind of for the time and place a crowning achievement uh, in Matsumoto's career. Uh, and you can definitely tell, you can see the the difference in what Rintar was able to bring to the screen there uh, between Space Captain, uh, Space Pirate Captain Harlock and the, the Galaxy Express movies. 
like you, pretty much my entry point was the Galaxy Express 3.9 movie. A great place to start. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that was a, a great first impression for the works of Rentaro. I don't believe I've seen anything else directed by him. I uh, could be wrong, though, could be misremembering. But, um, you know, I've it's got a good impression by me for sure. Yeah, he's a bit infamous, right? Uh, I have he, heard this. Yes. <laughs> I, I think I will defend him because even if the stories of the movies he's directed are definitely divisive, not not going to lie, I think that <laughs> they always have a really unique and interesting visual style. So I'm, I'm yes. a Rintaro defender, I'll say. It is uh, wonderful to see because I think that the 70s and, and TV animation, they were really struggling. They were working with such limited resources to make so much. And I and I totally respect that. I think that's beating an old old drum. But the what you get to see in terms of full potential of Rintaro, just a couple years after this comes out, like, yeah, a year. <laughs> and, and maybe that's credited to having, uh, I believe it's <laughs> Katsumi Itabashi. And that's Luigi Matsumoto's mechanical designer. S small tangent, he started working after high school uh, with Luigi Matsumoto illustrating, uh, but his father demanded he come back. And right before Galaxy Express was filmed, Matsumoto reaches out and says, or reaches out to the father specifically and says, I need your son to work on this film. And I think that Rintaro here it's it's a bit of a criticism, but the difference in the space battles and how they're and, and I don't think this is a time issue either. Like Yamato is before this and Yamato's got more visual interest in the space battles, I think, than this show. Maybe this is too early to bring this up. But does anybody have any thoughts on this uh, kind of where Rintaro is at this point to where he'll be in just like a year? Actually, I think right before Captain Harlock, he was working on a show called Arrow Emblem Hawk of the Grand Prix. Yes, Kazuo uh, Kamatsubaro actually worked on that as well, who was the character designer of this mm, show. Okay, yeah, and he actually, I, I think Rintaro, I think he quit. He didn't He didn't even finish the show. He quit halfway through Wow. Um, and went on to do Captain Harlock. And I, from what I understand, that Hawk show didn't do very well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, that, this would probably be like his first big, like, I would call it like the first prestige title he'd work on. Yeah, I mean, you've got uh, obviously a big name in Leiji Matsumoto there, and you've got a big concept, right? And he'd done, I, I think he did some, some giant robot anime. He did some robot boy anime. And that car show was had a bit of technical drawing in it. Yeah. But then... There's something <laughs> I feel like he was he was he learned a lot making this. Yeah. And as for one one, I just want to name drop this because it's kind of funny. He did direct a Shotaro Ishinomori show called Chobin, uh, which is like a cute little mascot show who where it's like a little it's kind of like, he kind of looks like a minion. And he li he has like but he has like Cyborg 009's hair and he lives in the forest with a bunch of happy animals. And so to see that juxtaposed with something like. Captain Harlock is really interesting to see with Rintaro. He worked, uh, Rintaro definitely worked on a lot of like cutesy, cutesy things. I was looking through his work and uh, this, this is definitely him maybe shooting above his weight class a little bit, but where he really succeeds, I think it, are in some scenes that you, you shared uh, John when they're hunting down the Mazone later, mm -hmm. you know, these really artsy shots, these really creative setups using shapes and forms to tell a story rather than but when he has to use a big set piece maybe that's not as yeah he, that's not a strong point wonders with limited animation mm -hmm. like and and artsy is the word i'd use for it it's artsy but not like annoying or pretentious it's it's using the limited resources just perfectly yeah i think he does that way better than he does some of these big set pieces at this point, at this point, that changes a lot in just a year. And, and I think uh, there's a bigger budget, obviously, there, too. So another interesting note I should have said uh, is that he would later direct a space uh, pirate Captain Harlock reboot, Herlock, in the title there, uh, Endless Odyssey, uh, 
Dimensional Voyage, I believe, maybe. It's, I'm forgetting the full title. It's a very long title. But this actually caused a bit of controversy as he, for the antagonist, the new. Uh, they use the Star of David exclusively as a symbol across their things, <laughs> across their on their hands and everything, uh, their spaceship. And this might have been innocent. It uh, could be more of a reference to something like alchemical. Uh, Key of Solomon was brought up on the podcast before, but this was an issue for him, and it was some bad press, and Matsumoto kind of separated himself after this from Rintaro. I don't know if either of you had ever, ever heard of this. I had never heard of this, but I'm super interested. Was this... <laughs> or you're not talking about, like, the 80s, uh, like... No, not Endless Orbit, SSX. Uh, like the OVA from the 90s? Yes, but not... Mm, might have been early 2000s, I think. Uh, you, I think you're talking about Harlock Saga. Harlock Her Saga, okay. No, not Harlock Saga. That's something else. Okay. That wasn't, I don't know if that was directed by Rintaro, but Outside Legend, The Endless Odyssey. I'm looking so at some if, images from it, and right, and right off the bat, I think this is a bit more controversial. It looks like Mime has a mouth. <laughs> In certain circles, I think you're right. I, particularly French ones, maybe you're right. <laughs> no, this is uh, this is this was a bit of an issue and a series I definitely want to want to cover someday because it's very unique. Um, Matsumoto, like I said, he separated himself from the storyline, but I think maybe a lot of that was motivated from the the controversy with the imagery. They ended up redoing a lot of that. Uh, like I said, though, uh, character designs by Kazuo Kamatsubara. And he is known for work on Nausicaa, Dr. Slump, Cutie Honey. And he would later redesign Captain Harlock for uh, Arcadia of My Youth and Endless Odyssey SSX. Uh, so he is the first main character designer to ever work with uh, Liji Matsumoto on animation. Soundtrack, also a big deal in pretty much every Liji Matsumoto series, is... So important, and this one done by Seiji Yokoyama, and it was apparently recorded by the Tokyo Philharmonic. Ichiro Mizuki sang the theme song. Uh, he was actually very recently in the news. He was diagnosed with lung cancer at some point. Uh, before this, he'd had vocal paralysis uh, a year before. But uh, an absolutely legendary soundtrack, as you may have listened to if you were listening to the, the live recording. I played a bit of it beforehand. I felt like in the last couple episodes we were hearing songs. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention. I felt like we were hearing songs that weren't in the rest of the show. And I was like, mm. man, they should have played these more. I agree. Especially when after you've heard Mayu's theme in literally every single episode. And and I I'm like, girl, learn another song. Mayu yeah. Mayu's theme has um if you've ever seen Robotech, it has the same vibe as um My Time to Be a Star. Where if, if you don't know Robotech, Min May she sings the song, My Time to Be a Star. And every time she sings it, she introduces it as her new song. Apparently, <laughs> it, it's a meme in the Robotech community that she only has one song because she she's on that same song. Apparently, she's on tour apparently, with her new single. There's that they were supposed to compose more songs for her. And they put that in as like a placeholder with the intention to change it later on and never did it. But now no. it's just a funny meme in the community. And that's, well, what, the, my, that's what Mayu's theme reminds me of. She might have been on tour, you know, promoing a new single. You know, she's got to push that. Heard it, it's new to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fume, uh, thoughts on the soundtrack? I mean, clearly it was incredibly popular in its time. I mean, I often browse on like Japanese auction sites and the like. And sometimes I'll look for Harlock stuff. And there's just a ton of vinyl records of the soundtrack just available and, you know, for pretty decent prices. So uh, evidently, it was uh, something very heralded in its day. Uh, and, you know, I I think it's super epic. But, you know, the Mayu theme that'll get on your nerves and every I mean, I mean, pretty much what you guys all said. I mean, I pretty much mirror everything. Yeah, no, good point. Yeah, it did. Uh, it, it, it did some numbers, I think. And there is an extensive uh, amount of. Harlock vinyl represses over represses. And it's almost one of those one of those soundtracks that that vinyl collectors maybe have always been interested in. You know, uh, weird example, King Crimson 
came to Spotify like a few years ago, but they said our vinyl sales were going up like the whole time. So we never really felt the need to, to go elsewhere. And I feel like maybe maybe you hit on something there that, you know, the otakus who also love vinyl maybe really dig the Harlock, especially because it's kind of the most accessible thing that you can like just turn on. That's it's most nostalgic. And I don't know. Also, I'm using um, I, I when I uh, I was translating some interviews with Toshiro Hirano and he had a, an extensive interview with Chume Watanabe, who did music for a lot of uh, giant robot shows like Mazinger. And he'd later go on to do like some uh, tokusatsu stuff as well. And he mentions that by the, in the late seventies, this was like a new thing, but record companies were starting to sponsor anime for the first time. Mm. That's why nowadays they use like, you know, they try to make the theme song be like a contemporary rock song and stuff is because it's all sponsored by Japanese record companies. So it could be that this was like, yeah, they knew they were going to be selling records. So you want to make the music better. So they really upped their music quality in the late seventies. I'm trying to think of, cause I think it's the same publisher who handled at least the majority of the Liege verse stuff. Uh, I think um, Columbia, right? Columbia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Columbia was on a lot of that stuff. A lot of that stuff, at least the TV stuff, I think too. They might've had different deals for movies and TV too. So legendary soundtrack. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, sea shanties galore. And uh, those are hitting, right? The kids are into it. Sea shanties. I, I've heard I've heard about them on TikTok. Well, that's all I really had on production. Maybe I could have gone deeper. Do, do any of you happen to have any any comments on any of the other staff or how it was created? Um, as far as staff goes, someone who I did want to call out was and I didn't even realize um, maybe I'd seen their name and it, it didn't click until more recently. But like half the show is written by Shozo Uehara. And I didn't actually realize he was like an anime writer. I knew him as a tokusatsu writer writing. He wrote like most of the episodes of original Kamen Rider and a bunch of stuff like that. So I was actually surprised um, after writing my big article on Kamen Rider to plug that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. Shoza Uihara wrote half of the show. That's well, that's a testament right to their to their abilities is, you know, Matsumoto speaks in a lot of romantic prose and Trans that's basically a translation of like romantic prose from Italian and French sources, romantic sources. Right. And you're getting that in Japanese and then we're kind of getting it. Then it's got to go through Shozo. Right. And then it's got to go through whoever else rewrote it. Then it's got to go through a translator because I can't speak Japanese. And we're getting so many filters on this, this very specific type of dialogue that Matsumoto typically wants to deliver. And that's no small task. I'll say that even the English manga struggles sometimes to really translate it as epically as it should be. Right. Yeah. It's not as like epic as the manga comes off to me in the way that they wrote the show, but the show isn't quite as epic as the manga either. And I think you know, we'll we'll kind of get to that. Uh, talk about some more differences here, but let's let's talk about just the general themes of the show. And I think the number one theme, and maybe the hottest take of this whole show, is be a fucking man. Fucking man, it's time to man up and be a real man. I mean, am I wrong? Is this too hot of a take to comment on? Uh, no. And I think uh, you know, just looking at Harlock's design, just one look at him, I think that's sort of encapsulates that whole theme like you don't even have to hear him say anything uh you don't even have to see him do anything you just take one look at him and you kind of know he works going. he works as even like an onlooker he doesn't have to say anything to be cool or or it be imposing or represent the model of a man right i think that's what you're saying is he's drawn very specifically to propose a model of a man I would say to children, <laughs> Japanese children specifically. Uh, something I, I really like is how it's like he isn't someone who ever like questions himself. There's a specific scene that's stuck out to me where um, much later in the show, they have the uh, the uh, woman who's the the Mazone, the spy basically is on their ship and she she faints in the shower and she's trying to get Harlock's attention. She's trying to seduce him and everything. And he just picks her up, takes her to like the med the med center. And just drops her on the ground and says, I think she has anemia and walks out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That one, I was like, that one, I didn't know. 
Now we're getting into spoilers. We're talking about who's a Mazone and who's not. Maybe I'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah, but in really this being a man concept, I think it can boil down to having a, a, an honorable code of ethics. He wants an honorable code and consistent code of ethics for not just himself, but for his crew and for especially Tadashi Daiba, who is, you know, this kind of orphan child he's taken on and we'll talk more about. But you could also say that the protags end up being a bit uh, of shameless moralizers just constantly by nature of like going back to this code of ethics all the time. And, and they're really it really comes down to you know, observing that, dis I think it manifests in the disgust, right? Like when I say they're being shameless moralizers, I say they are highly disgusted with everyone around them and they have no qualms with pointing it out. I would agree with that. So, well, something I really liked about it was uh, when it comes to like, it seems like there's this mutual respect, even if they're opposed to each other between Commander Karuda and Captain Harlock. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, kind of a little different than what you were saying, but um, the way I saw their relationship was really interesting where it's like they're on complete, they're on opposing sides, but they like, like Harlock commander Karuda is sticking to what he believes in. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, he's not just doing things because the government tells him. In fact, when the government tells him to do things, he's like, that's not what we should be doing for the people. Yeah. It, it almost, it reminds me a lot of like um, when I was checking out the gun for, I'm going to ramble a little bit here. But when I was sure. checking out the Gun Frontier manga, I was getting this feeling that the characters had this sort of analogy to almost like Lupin the Third, where like I felt like there was a bit of Lupin in Tochiro, a bit of G mm -hmm. in Harlock, a bit of Fujiko in uh, the girl, I forget her name. And then I, what I read didn't have a Commander Karuda character, but Commander Karuda really does feel like a Zenigata almost. And in Lupin, there's like this kind of understanding between Lupin and Zenigata, where they're, they are opposed to each other. But they also understand each other and they know what their like morals are. Mm -hmm. Where uh, they accuse Lupin of murder, of like murdering an innocent person. And Zenigata, even though he wants to catch Lupin, he's like, no, that would Lupin would never do that. Right. Yeah, it doesn't that's, fit. That's the feeling I got from them with the, the whole code and being a man thing. Yeah. And you see it not being carried out by his other opponent, Lafrasia or Rathlasia, however you end up saying it. And in that she often will not obey a, a code of ethics and very explicitly does not. So showing the difference in there's almost there's redeemability if you just have a code that you live by. Mm -hmm. And if you have no code, you're going to be cast to the shadows, uh, <laughs> to the shadow realm, so to speak. <laughs> well, I was just going to add on to what you were saying about Queen Lafrigia. Uh, You know, I thought it was really interesting to sort of see their uh their dichotomy between harlock and lafrigia because you know she'll always use these underhanded tactics like the one episode i can't remember which one it actually was when they had the mazone medic medic flat mm -hmm. flagging for supplies and uh harlock was like okay well we'll give it to that or i think it was the doctor who made that call yeah, by that time, they've complicated things a lot, right? With the Mazone, who are the Mazone? Uh, and you think there is maybe a remote chance this could be not, but you kind of know. <laughs> she knows that he has this honorable code of ethics, and she's basically taking advantage of that. And, you know, it's an interesting little dichotomy there. Another big theme that we have here are outcasts and stigmas and social stigmas. We see it manifest with physical disfigurement, right? Harlock has a giant scar on his face, a disfiguring scar and a, and a lost eye. Or you could be a potato man, which is also a terrible figure, uh, physical disfigurement, right? You know, that could me, be terrible. Can I, I, I need to ask you this. Does, is Harlock supposed to... I, I, when I started watching the show, I thought Harlock had robot legs because when he walks, there's that sound effect. Mm. I'm trying to imply he has robot legs. But <laughs> right. Brought up. Well, another person once brought up to me that Harlock almost looks like he's always got a bit of a, a swerve on, so to speak. He's a little a little tipsy at all times, possibly, possibly. Or it's, the animation is just really stiff. <laughs> so that happens, too. 
you know, one could almost think that Harlock was trying to start a circus aboard the Arcadia with all the talented little people he has aboard. Yes, yes. You could be forgiven for thinking that. No, it is a bit of a of a circus. There's no doubt. And it's got like the the fanciful back to it, too. So it almost looks like a circus caravan as well as being like the galleon of a of a ship. Uh, but that's probably not intentional. You also deal with social alienation, right? We have wanted criminals on there. We have just plain old contrarians who think that the world is ending when nobody else wants to deal with that. Uh, we have a bunch of what could be described often as weak, quote unquote, nerds. Uh, I think that makes up a fair amount of the Arcadia. You know, you might have a wife murderer on board, too, or you might be hanging out with one. You might know one. Right. There's a lot of stigmas and social alienation going on when it comes to the social alienation. We, we see that happen. Let's let's just go right to fuck the government, too. Right. That's another huge theme. The government is only concerned with the perks of being in government and the reelections they are going to have. And they're just totally inept. So. You know, fuck that government. There's that battle between social acceptance and social normatives going on. But there's a weird dichotomy between these guys, too, because I'll, I'll say this and I'll let you guys talk. There's a bit of a problem of they hate the government so much, but the government is so inept that it allows them to be pirates unhindered. They don't do anything about them anymore. They're still bothered by this, but it's almost a premonition. A long kind of tangent ramble there, but. I've been watching a lot of stuff from the early 70s recently. Um, and something that was very popular was, I, f- I only found this out recently, is that there's a, a word in Japanese. Uh, it's spokon, which is a portmanteau of sports and cone, cone meaning guts. And that's usually translated as a show with a gutsy sports vibe. Characters that have the, the you know, the the, the being an athlete or the characters who face adversity and their whole thing is to strive and overcome it. And it's a show about uh, tenacity and, you know, inner strength and, you know, all these positive qualities with like an athletic sort of even shows like a uh, common rider has a huge sense of this. You get You get a really strong sense that there's like a, uh, like a, a you know, like a, a sports team kind of feeling to it. Get a robo. All the characters are these hot blooded youths who, all actually do have sports backgrounds canonically. Mm. Um, And so it's something that is something that's very pushed in Japan as something as like, this is a very positive trait for a young person to, to work with others, to want to better the world, to uh, be outgoing, to overcome your adversity. And that's Japan in a nutshell, right? That's like, that's Nippon. That's, that's what it is to live on an Island and be in that kind of uh, secluded environment just to kind of harp on this point a little bit more i mean japan is an isolated and often destroyed area and to to survive in that to have a culture that lasts thousands of years you kind of got to be a little bit you know all for one all you know one for all join the club let's do this together cooperate 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 and that's something that was so interesting in harlock is that you have a whole crew of characters who are all these introverts. Uh, mm-hmm. They're all these weird characters. They're all characters that have that are, you know, that would be looked at as outcasts. You have Yadaran, who's always just like playing with model kits and ignoring his duties and just doing building little ships. Uh, you have Mime, who's this weird alien that's kind of horny, but drunk all the time. <laughs> it, they are. The, yeah. You have Tadashi Daiba, who uh every day he wakes up and chooses violence yes 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 that poor boy and we'll talk more about the characters specifically soon but you're absolutely right each and every one of these freaks uh and i say that as a freak um very they become very lovable and you're right i i think it was important to kind of put that message out there that Sometimes there does need to be a band of freaks that saves the world. Uh, Fumecom, any thoughts on on that? Touching on the inept government that enables piracy. I mean, they pretty much well established from the get go that humanity at this point in time is just settled. They Mm -hmm. they have their luxuries and that's all they need. And you see the prime minister and all the government officials, you know, they're watching their races or playing golf and. Mm-hmm. On this, you know, and it's sort of a all, you know, all they care about is elections, 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 
And to them, any sort of threats outside of that, it's out of sight, out of mind. And it's just kind of just kind of goes to show, you know, if you settle in life, you know, what's going to happen outside of that? Yeah, there's a lot of stagnation. Yeah, I think it would be funny. You know, we see cities get bombed. What if it would really drive the point home if we saw like an arena, an arena getting, you know, destroyed by the Mazone or something there? Because you really don't see uh, anybody in sports really like the whole time. I don't I don't even like the only sports you see are maybe the politicians enjoying the spectacle of it all baseball in that one episode. right yes there was just that one time a, a league of their own uh however you say that in japanese and and it is interesting it's like the center of the world government is kind of in japan maybe i'm not really sure if this is like a world government or just japan or what um yeah, that's what i was wondering as well i thought it was just kind <laughs> of a world government they had set up but Near the end of the series, they sort of established that the show was primarily taking place in Japan or like the parts that were on Earth, you know, when he was going to visit Mayu and stuff like that. To contextualize it, I would say if you were in Japan in the 70s, you might think that Japan would be the center of the world in like a thousand years. Fair enough. Just Japan was experiencing the miracle economy, which, you know, Leiji Matsumoto's work goes hand in hand with it. His rise and fall pretty much goes hand in hand in a lot of ways with with the miracle economy. He kind of drops off before the Nintendo spikes, but it's this group mentality that's dragging everybody down and it's creating an environment where nobody is thinking about their future. Right. And that's what you were saying, Fumekam. They're complacent. And so what is another huge theme here is sacrificing for your future. And the reason why everyone is complacent and lazy is because they no longer have to make any sacrifices in their lives. And they've forgone the practice of sacrifice, which is culturally relevant uh, in a lot of ways. It can be pathologized, no, no, no disagreement there, but sacrifice being super important. And basically we, what we see in this show is the suffering of the Arcadia. First, I was gonna say it was the suffering of Mayu because we get her early episodes She's suffering so much. Every time Harlock does anything, it makes uh, her suffer. Uh, anytime Harlock hurts, she suffers. And it's like the, this innocent suffering for the sins of man, for their future, a very, dare I say, Christ-like role that they're fulfilling here. And you get the endless crucifix imagery in this show. And uh, it, it's very apparent. Sacrifice. Uh, well, I totally agree with the whole without sacrifice, you know, you don't want to, you know, you could say the movie Wally stole this from Captain Harlock, basically. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I've been, even in real life, that's why I was hesitant to say anything because I don't want to bring up real life. But like, it's weird working in an office and meeting people who are just like so satisfied with this super mundane job. And they're like, oh, I just work. I just work. And then I can't wait to sleep on the weekend. It's like, that's just like, <laughs> no, it's it's honestly infuriating to see people like that and so i even went back and just re-watched that first episode where it has the bit where it talks about people all they do is uh like they just sit and they watch the same tv shows and just they live in the moment and i'm just like that's <sighs> when, when harlock, yeah when harlock is like that mentality will be the end of the the human race human race won't grow if in, in under those circumstances i 100 percent agree <laughs> Yeah, there's a loss of meaning, uh, maybe a death of God, as Nietzsche might have said. I mean, you said, you know, I don't want to talk about real life, but I mean, I think these themes are so real. Part of that sacrifice is the sacrifice of belonging, right? To bring it back to that concept we were talking about, about group acceptance. And the, the deeper problem here being they face insurmountable odds because of that exclusion. They don't fight this endless force, endless alien force with any assistance other than one ship with 42 souls on it. How, how is the Arcadia going to overcome? Is it going to be the Arcadia itself? Is it Harlock's cunning? Is it the limited animation of the Mazone themselves preventing them from standing up for themselves? What are the answers? What do you guys think? Well, I think it's just the... Uh the sort of lack of will of the human race that's just sort of been bottled up and expanded into the Arcadia. You know, humans have just lost their will to fight for anything. And 
Harlock basically has to compensate for all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Sacrificing for everybody. You made, and you also made me realize that like, um, just thinking about it right now, talking about it, I didn't even realize it, but Harlock has this like uh, underlying theme of like a found family, which is mm-hmm. not something that's prevalent in a lot of Japanese media. Cause Japanese media focuses on, you know, your biological family. These are the people you're related to. That's such a big thing for Japan. And so it's, mm-hmm. it's interesting to think about that, how like you have characters like Mime, last of her race, but like she has this family in the, yes. the crew of the Arcadia. That's the that's the last big theme I wanted to talk about. Uh, thank you for the transition being the last of your own. Uh, Mime, the last of her own race of aliens. Uh, Harlock, uh, kind of the last uh, man of his kind. I mean, there's other men on the Arcadia, but none of them are like Harlock. Tadashi Daiba. Uh, one of the last, you know, scientists on Earth willing to speak up. What he was one of the last people on Earth living to actually f- stand up against the the government and and turn their back on it. So being the last of your kind takes many forms, and uh, it, there's a duty in your loneliness, right? There's a duty, and this maybe circles all the way back to having a code of ethics and being a man. There's a duty to the solitude that faces you now. And you are the sole bearer of a load. Moving on, uh, let's talk about how Japan accepted it. And I think really the the key point here is that it beat the Uchu curse, the space curse. Um, This is something that took down Yamato originally in its original run, cutting it down to a, a much shorter anime. And there's a few reasons why maybe the Uchu curse existed. Any thoughts on the Uchu curse, guys? I actually do. I, I, um, I've researched it a lot, actually. So, mm-hmm. um, but it's funny, Uchu Curse is such a good name for it. I, um, I came across the term when I was doing my Tatsunoko videos a couple of years ago, because one of the most egregious examples is Tatsunoko's Tekaman anime, their original Tekaman, where the uh, notorious ending, notorious final episode that the narrator says, and now Tekaman will go to fight his foe it will be the final battle oh no that's how uh it happened for captain harlock in france originally they didn't get the last few episodes of captain harlock in france i mean that means something we can talk about international i'll talk about international reception in a second but uh it was definitely powerful um i think uh, did you did you Kind of get your point across, John. Well, and I also wanted to say that when I was um, translating things for Tatsunoko, Uchu Curse is such a better term. They called it the Space Jinx in what I translated. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I heard but, Space Curse first, but, but Uchu. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was like um, I know that that was something where they were re- eventually refusing to do space themed anime um, to the point that like I, I think that well, for one with Harlock, I think after Star Wars there was talk in the industry of will this work now maybe we can pull it off you know star wars was a hit and harlock would have was 78 right so that would have been after star wars yes yeah well it's a yeah it's a chicken and egg i uh, harlock is 77 january 77 oh, i don't so know when manga, it, manga is before anime after right and that's why there's a weird chicken and egg thing with with harlock i i didn't even mention in my notes here but the original sketches of leia or no, not Leia, the original sketches of the female protagonist that was supposed to be the leader of the Star Wars movie franchise until they changed it to Han Solo, or not Han Solo, Luke Skywalker. The sketches of her look a lot like Kei Yuki and Captain Harlock. Oh, so they were like looking at Gun Frontier. Well, they might have seen Kei Yuki while they were making, while they were developing costumes and it was still going to be a girl. I don't know... There's something going on here. I don't know why, but these illustrations look a lot alike. I'll show them in the cut uh, show and I'll show you guys later. It's on uh, the R Star Blazers website where you can see this uh, more clearly. But if you look up some of the keywords I mentioned, you might find it. Um, But it's very striking what happened with the Star Wars uh, Harlock thing there, too. I'll describe it a little bit more. And some reasons that I think uh, might be happening here. I think it had a lot to do with the technical limitations of the format. A problem that I run into watching Space Pirate Captain Harlock on a 4K monitor is are these dark, like dark exposures on a dark background with tiny details that are drawn with black line art. That's not 
super tight. Uh, there's no clarity. You can't tell what's going on in most of these shots. Uh, if the Yamato wasn't bright red, I don't know if people would have bought as as well. And if Harlock's storytelling and other compensating factors weren't there, I don't know if they would have survived either. Uh, they're both kind of exceptions of, of their time. Uh, and they also have a lot of cool like planetary shots and they do the cool Rintaro thing. But uh, it's a slower start and a stronger finish. I don't know. Am I alone in thinking these space battles are a little hit and miss? No, I'd agree with you. Even for the time. Yeah, and I, I listen, I like that the ship has a giant knife on the end of it. That's the best part. But, yeah, I felt I like you needed more that. stuff like that. Right. More physical activity, right? More. Yeah. You yeah. see the Arcadia turn around all the time. <laughs> it's just. I, I was going to ask you this. Um, maybe this you plan to talk about this later, but I only noticed a couple episodes in that Harlock ship is not the Harlock ship. That, that's not the Arcadia I was familiar with, because after a couple episodes, I got curious and I was like, oh, I wonder if they have any model kits of that that ship. Mm -hmm. I looked it up and I was like, and they were, I was seeing like, oh, there's actually like two different designs. That's not the Arcadia I'm familiar with. So like, mm -hmm. I guess the Galaxy Express 3.9 used a different design. Yeah, I think there were some hangups between the manga publisher, Toei TV, and Toei Movie. And through all this nonsense, somebody said, fuck it, we're making it look like a dick. Uh, that's, you know, pardon my language, but uh, the, the, the green Arcadia, as it's called, which I'll point out why that's a weird thing to call it in a second, is far more phallic and uh, far less like a, like a big air carrier, maybe? I don't know how else to describe it. Like an air carrier with a galleon in the, on the back, if we're going to talk about this and that design. Um, I will wrap up though real quick. The original Arcadia uh, was colored green in the manga. That makes sense because when I looked up model kits, there's a green alternate version of the mm -hmm. Harlock, so uh, of the Arcadia. So that makes sense. Probably would have been a better decision, given the, what I'm talking about. With you know, you're watching on an old phosphor screen in Japan in 1977, probably black and white. It, you're not going to see any of this stuff. So let's talk a little bit about the international uh, localization of Captain Harlock, uh, both domestic for us in the USA and abroad. And we'll st I want to start out on a good note because it kind of goes downhill quick. Huge success in France and Italy. I don't know if you guys know anything about this, but I'm around French and Italian people all day. Every time I'm on the Liegeverse, facebook.com slash Liegeverse, which I forgot to plug. A ton of French people and Italian people love Captain Harlock. And it's probably because there's such a big French influence, a romantic influence on Matsumoto's work, like I said. That female character design that he's got in a big part is based on a German actress uh, named Marianne Hold, who uh, he noticed first in a film, a French and West German film, uh, dubbed in both, uh, recorded in, it might have been recorded in both, Marianne of My Youth. OK, so you might already notice that sounds like Arcadia of my youth, which is the movie that details Captain Harlock's origin story. And if you dig a little deeper, that movie is based on novels by Peter de la Mendelssohn called Painful Arcadia. So the entire so much so many genes in the in the Liegeverse DNA, I just explained to you, you have a lot of answers now. <laughs> Well, that's fitting that they got Rintaro because he's known for actually using like a lot of French film techniques. Yes, that makes. Yeah. And, and you know, when we talked about Galaxy Express 3.9, which I almost want to talk about it again. I talked about it for two hours in that episode. I'll do uh, maybe three. I'll do it again because it's so damn good. I just want to talk about it with more people. But some interesting fun facts there. Uh any thoughts on France and Italy? You guys ever heard of this? Or, the, or the, Actually, I, I have. I um sure. One, I always wanted to. I love uh, collecting clean anime openings. You know, without all the text on it, textless openings. Mm -hmm. And uh, Captain Harlock was one I really wanted. And I had been like reaching out to people to see, like, because it's not on the DVDs. Toei didn't put it out on the American or the Japanese DVDs, from what I could hear. I managed to get in touch with someone through um. Femboy Films' Discord, I, they go by Kineko Video now. At the time, they were Femboy Films. 
But, oh, um, I didn't realize they changed their name. I guess it's fitting because I got a lot more exposure yeah, uh, yeah, recently. Yeah. People, people uh, complained that it wasn't a very professional sounding name. No, so, it's I rough. Would've, I would have said, no, let's play hardball. But uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. When you got an investor knocking on the door, though, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Speculation at, on the industry right now. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah. So, someone in their discord actually tipped me off to it that what I see, I was searching Captain Harlock. I needed to be searching Albator. Right. So apparently because the French got their, their DVDs have way more special features than ours or even the Japanese. They mm -hmm. actually have the creditless opening. On oh, DVDs. cool. Well, that's actually what I was about to ask. I, I couldn't remember if it was France or Italy that renamed it to Albator. But yeah. I, I have a, a good friend of mine. He's a huge cell collector. And apparently uh, I guess in France, they had a bunch of original promotional art commission mm -hmm. just for and Italy. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and the, he was able to find a bunch of cells that were made exclusively for French promotional material. Cool. He sent it to me and he was like, he doesn't know a whole lot about Captain Harlock. So he was sending it to me and asking me about, and I was like, Oh, uh, Albator. I think that's what they call Harlock in, in, a uh, in France or Italy or something like that. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can tell your friend, they can always learn more about lazy at facebook.com slash lazy Um, also it was so big in France. That's why Daft Punk, it had the Luigi Matsumoto Discovery album because they're French. Mm -hmm. It's not the other way around. Uh, Luigi Matsumoto was not fans of uh, Daft Punk like Trash Taste might let you believe. How did that even happen, that anime? Uh, was it literally just the guy I listened to it and was like, holy shit, I gotta make, a, gotta make an anime to go with this? I think, yeah, I, I don't know exactly, but I think Matsumoto Deji was like a fan of Daft Punk. Yeah. And then they just like worked something out and then... Uh, it's the opposite way, Daft Punk, uh, hero worshipping, and getting Interstellar 5555 made. Uh, absolutely beautiful work. One of the best things in, in the Liegeverse, modern, in terms of quality, etc. But I will say real quick about France, renamed from Harlock to avoid any copyright dispute over the character Captain Haddock. I think that's fish puns or something. Yeah, they had a problem there. Uh, Captain Haddock, very popular. Kind of reminds me, he looks kind of like uh, Bluto from Popeye, oh, is who is also, I wouldn't be surprised because I, I, I think it's a European co comic book creator. So yeah, that would, that may be the same verse, multiverse there. It is, it is the captain from Tintin. Yeah, uh, he looks like Bluto. Bluto is really popular in Japan. There's so much circular, <laughs> there's so much feedback going on here. The person who dubbed Harlock in France also dubbed the voice of Harrison Ford, Danny Glover, Richard Gere, and Jeff Goldblum, all pretty unique voices and uh, strong voices. And the latest artist to draw Harlock in an official capacity is Jerome Alquier. He created a comic book series called Memories de la Arcadia, Memories of the Arcadia, uh, that released in France. It's on, it, I think they're going to volume three pretty soon. Uh, knock on wood, no, no real word about that. Um, but volume one just got released by a blaze publishing who I was really lucky to get to work with over the course of the last year, promoting basically weekly behind the scenes artwork from all sorts of different covers they did for that. Jerome Alquier was also on the show, too. So that's a lot of plugs. Sorry, guys. But uh, I wanted to get that out of the way. So, yeah, let's talk about American dubbing, the, the dubbing rights buyers between like 1980 and 1990. This is, I would say some of the worst IP mishandling of that era, given how potent the source material was that they couldn't get it to work here after several tries. You know, Dragon Ball got a lot of tries too, but it eventually caught. You know, we missed something here because of what I see is maybe mishandling. Well, I feel like ultimately the issue with the IP being mishandled all boils down to the low episode count of the original anime. Because I believe you have to have like... I think it's 65 or so episodes to be able to sell a show into syndication. And of course, Harlock is uh, 42 episodes. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I combine it with the sequel series. That's still, I think, a couple episodes short. Let me get granular about that now. I'll fill in the gaps. It was uh, purchased by uh, Harmony Gold. And so we're talking about Robotech. Right. Wait, didn't it, it got a it got the Ziv release before that, right? 
Yeah. Is it- yeah. We'll go out of order. This is 1985. This is the second dubbing they get. Harmony Gold, Robotech. Uh, is 85 fresh off? That's like fresh off the heels of Robotech, no? Robotech dropped year. in 85, and it was a, a kind of, a, honestly, it was a flash in the pan for the mainstream. It was only mainstream for a year, so by 86, it was dying down. Yeah, but the, it's it was success, right? Yeah. Like, it hit... Even, even though it was only mainstream for that year, it basically rooted itself and, like, became the foundation of, like, the anime community at the time. Mm-hmm. So, like... All right. It had like a kind of like what Star Trek had, where it was like while it was on TV, it was popular, and then it had like its cult following. I'm going to step back. So Harmony Gold, remember Harmony Gold in '85, but we'll, let's bounce back to Ziv because you know about this too, Fume. The 1981 Ziv release. Okay, so this is the the original anime, made four episodes dubbed total, episodes one through three, and then nine. Maybe they wanted to show off the beginning, and then maybe once it got going. Uh, I forget what nine is off the top of my head. If anybody remembers, let me know. Uh, but it got a direct video release. Hilariously bad. Kenny Lauderdale posted a compilation. The manga had better voices, I believe the title was. Fume, you, you have that uh, you have that Ziv release on vinyl. Uh, yes, I do. And I also have both of the original VHS tapes of it. This company, Ziv, there's really not a whole lot of information documented about them. They were a... Mm-hmm. Uh, seemingly a prolific television syndication company in the 70s and at some point between like 1978 and 1980 they had acquired a bunch of licenses from toei so it wasn't just captain harlock they also had captain future candy candy uh lun lun the flower angel and it's my understanding i mean like i said there's really nothing you can look up about these dubs they produced a bunch of pilots for them And we're trying to sell them to syndicators and different television markets. And ultimately, none of those pilots, with maybe a couple exceptions, went anywhere. So they just dumped them all straight to video. They went to uh, Family Home Entertainment and had them distribute their pilots. And pretty much that's where that ends in terms of the release of them. Yeah, I think there was a lot of like limited, limited market releases, maybe Hawaii. Uh, I know that I think I'm pretty sure Ziv is also the one that they they didn't just have anime. They had Toei's Tokusatsu library, too, because there's a release of uh, Ishinomori's Daitetsu Jin 1-7, where it was renamed as Brain 17. And the main character, Saburo, is renamed Stevie. And I'm pretty sure that was Ziv because I know it was put out by Family Home Entertainment. So, yeah, they had also had Tokusatsu rights there. And I'm I'm kind of curious how like if there's like a catalog somewhere of everything they put out, that'd be something cool to archive. And, um, and I, I think have also- seen it. Oh, the Ziv sorry. dub. And from what I understand, there's like two versions. Like there's one where the Harlock dub is it's pretty like accurate to the show. And then another one where they just went bonkers with it. Their tissues are made of paper. That's why they burn like paper. <laughs> Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Greetings. I am Pan Bed 3. I am beautiful. I love you. I like you too. Okay. With Ziv, both Ziv, is it what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one and nine were actually dubbed like actual, like they were actual episodes, and then two and three are like gag dubs. Okay, that's why. That's it's why they different happens. voice casts okay. in the between the two dubs. It's like it, it's two completely yeah. separate VHS tapes, but they're both just called Captain Harlock, which is really confusing. I spent so much time cramming the series itself. I wish I would have gone back and watched more of this. I think I remember hearing again Kenny Lauderdale. I I'd love to have him on a on a podcast like this, man. Because so, Lum Lum, I think you mentioned that sounded familiar. I think he's brought up Ziv a couple times as well. And yeah, it's it's a mix of really bad dub and and okay dub. So that doesn't really go anywhere. Maybe they shot themselves in the foot with that goof dub i don't know what was up with that i I Uh, think that they did one and nine first as like a here's our actual pitch and then it didn't sell so they were like what if we tried to make a comedy and then just like goofed over it and then they're like no that doesn't work either oh god yeah i think it's just two different failed pitches that like like i was saying earlier no one was interested in picking the series up So they just dumped them straight to video. But I will say something that I did find when I was trying to do research on it was uh, there are some television catalogs that I found. And under Ziv International, they said they had 42 episodes of Captain Harlock available for purchase. Yet, you know, clearly 
they only had four episodes actually dubbed. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I think there was a lot of false marketing going on around Harlock. And let me let me come back to that. Let's talk about Harmony Gold again, too, because their butchering was very unique uh, and inspired by, like I said, what they'd done with Robotech, which is essentially a mashup of three different animes. What happens with Harmony Gold is they purchase the rights to the original anime. But like you said, Fume, it's only 42 episodes long. And even with SSX added to that, uh, that's only 22. Uh, yeah, only 22 episodes. So they're at 44, I think, there. There's still kind of over Barra and Toei knew. So they were like, oh, SSX, you want that too? That's a little bit more. Because SSX. Fewer, so. Well, they, well, they'd lost money on it. Uh, SSX was not a, a success in the market. They cut it down from its original, originally planned 42 episode run. Toei maybe was looking to a, a bit. They might have known too. Like they need 65 episodes, but they're saying they'll buy this. Let's sell to them real quick before they realize their mistake. But they could have been ignorant of it too. So they take this. Instead, they see, oh, they've got this other Liegeverse anime series called Queen Melania, which came out after Galaxy Express 39. Also not as successful but uh, not enough to be like shortened or canceled or anything. So what they do, they decide they're going to mash up these series and somehow spin this narrative of Queen Melania and Captain Harlock together. And it's a bit of a cluster. Queen Melania, no, it's Captain Harlock and the Queen of a Thousand Years. That's what it's so called. One of the first live streams I ever did on my channel was I um, took the VHS rip of the first episode and I was replacing the VHS video with the DVD rips of Captain Harlock and Queen Melania and placing the footage into place so that we can get at least a 480p version of the show. And I was yeah. like, going to make it a regular thing where every like every stream I try to make more of an episode and I, I you know try to see if I can do the whole series. Toei was not a fan of me doing the footage <laughs> on stream that much. Didn't even think about it. I was like, oh, well, I'm editing it. And you, it's not in the full screen, right? So no, they, they, they caught it. Um, so not doing those again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep those streams on the DL. But maybe someday it could could exist, no? Oh, maybe. I'd need to have a lot of free time on my hands. Yeah, there you go. Well, maybe it'll show up on your Patreon someday. Who knows? Check out uh, Mercury Falcon's Patreon. I'll plug you there. Yeah, I think there was also another planned dub for this that I forgot to mention. The William Winkler dubs? Yeah. The, those actually were made. Those were actually two compilation films where they took different episodes and mashed them together. Uh, I believe they were only ever released on Japanese exclusive streaming sites. I can't remember uh, which ones exactly, but uh, there's something on uh, archive.org, too. Yeah, they, they're they're all on there. Uh, OK, uh, my understanding is uh, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, a higher executive at Toei. Uh, he basically wanted to create a bunch of English dubs of vintage mm -hmm. Toei properties so that they could actually you know, own them themselves and not have it licensed out to Funimation or whatever. So they went to William Winkler and he produced all these dubs of uh, Harlock, Fist of the North Star, Lun Lun the Flower Angel, and a few others I can't remember at the moment, uh, like Starzinger. Uh, I think they also did okay. King. Yeah, a bunch. Of another uh, another Leiji verse. Well, not Leiji verse, but Leiji Matsumoto uh, anime. There's Starzinger. It's something I want really bad. I am personally a dub guy, probably because I'm a little ADD. And I'm so sad we don't have anything proper for this series. Even if it wasn't good, I'd still take it at this point. I It made everything so much harder for me personally. And other friends that I had uh, who would have watched with me said, I just can't do the sub. <laughs> I'm just sad it doesn't exist. Honestly, that first Ziv International dub was actually... I I was just watching it before we came on here, actually. I actually think it was pretty good. I mean, mm -hmm. the script, it's not 100% accurate, but, you know, I, I think it was definitely pretty serviceable. It's just a shame it never really turned into anything more than just a pilot. You know, that, that yeah. was, I remember, like, the, I remember thinking, like, it was insanely accurate with, like, the exception being that, like, I know they changed Yadaran to Youngblood, which I thought was a cool name change. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I as like for that. the William Winkler dubs, uh, I've never seen the Harlock one. I didn't realize Harlock was one of them, but I'm very familiar with the Fist of the North Star ones. 
uh, and they are they are a sight to behold. They also, <laughs> I know that the William Winkler dub for Fist of the North Star, the scripts that Toei used uh, were actually from France or France or Italy, because there's uh, name changes in the in their Fist of the North Star dub that are from the European dubs. Like, um, like the French Fist of the North Star is very infamous. Non, mais si jamais tu essaies de bouger, tu exploseras tout simplement. Boom, boom, boom. It's very funny. Yeah, because uh, like I know one of the changes was that like a lot of characters maintain their Japanese name like, you know, Toki and Shin. But uh, one name change that I always thought was weird was that they changed Rao to Raul. Okay, that's Raul. Like, yeah, that's from like the Italian or French dub. And that's in the William Winkler dub as well. Okay, that's that's great. Yeah, so they kept the name degradation in from a particular uh, a localization. That that's great. They did a good job there. I mean, this was like this. There wasn't a big window for this space opera thing, as as big as space opera was for Star Wars. I mean, the rest of the market of space fantasy only kind of thrived from like. 77 to 83 and maybe a little beyond those borders but they only had so long to get this right and by the time harmony gold drops the ball it's just not going to be part of american culture in any way and i think i think that's pretty sad i think we could have used some some captain harlock for the kids because especially in france the people that i've spoken with in france that remember it as children remember it specifically because it didn't talk down to them they remember it specifically because it, it talked to them like adults and it dealt with mature themes and it wasn't like all the other what I've heard described as crap, like, you know, the other stuff. It was it was exceptional for children. So it's ironically sad. what that's what everyone loved about Robotech is that they didn't gloss over the fact that in the Japanese version, the characters die. They left that. in, Right. And that was something that was really big with Robotech. And it's weird that they would just like not have the same reverence for Harlock. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's the talking about early localization and reverence is kind of like, are we what are we talking about here? I don't that's kind of rough. But um, yeah, they definitely dropped the ball here. Uh, and another ball drop in 1989, tangentially related, always fun to mention, Eternity Comics run, uh, the Malibu Comics imprint that bought the rights, apparently to recreate the manga. They ended up doing 33 issues. But Whoever sold them these rights didn't have the rights themselves. They themselves may have been a pirate. Uh, they got got. And they were allowed to finish the series, which is weird, though. Once Toei caught on that they'd been sold false rights, Toei said, you can finish it. And that's so weird to me that it almost comes off like a Matsumoto decision. I say this all the time, but uh, it doesn't sound like a very Toei thing. As You guys are anime YouTubers. Does it sound like Toei would be understanding of somebody using their intellectual property unauthorized? I, I think it's not so much of them want like giving a blessing as much as it is maybe just at the time they felt like it's, you know, we're not losing anything from it. So. Yeah. Really well, they didn't get the money, but yeah, they might not have cared. You're right. You're right. Matsumoto wasn't at his peak of popularity in 93, but uh, it's almost like I see Matsumoto going, I have pirates. OK, you're fine. Wrap it up, boys. Um, but that's all I had to say about the localization. One thing I was going to say about the comics, uh, they actually got the rights, the, the quote unquote rights from a company called Coral Pictures. And that mm -hmm. company, as far as I've looked into them, again, they're just like Ziv. There's really no information you can find about them. But they did actually legitimately get the rights to Ziv International's library. So that's how mm -hmm. they had Harlock material. Uh, but I think whoever sold that stuff to Coral, I don't think they were honest with them about some stuff or whatever. Because you know, well, they, actually, they also had the VHS releases that came out later, and they were promised to be unedited uncut mm -hmm. you know, for the first not time true ever. and it was just the ziv dubs again so right i don't think it was intentional piracy on their part i just think it was a series of unfortunate circumstances 
Yeah, the, the selling of IP rights internationally, especially, and this is super true in video games as well uh, during the era, era, a lot of napkin contracts, right? A lot of meeting up in a restaurant and just kind of like get this deal done and moving so we can get something started here. And I think, yeah, that's definitely probably a big part of what happened here. I think there's a chance that Coral Pictures might have shown the movies in South America or shown the shown the shows in South America. I got to do some more research on that front. But yeah, they were uh, a South American company primarily, but they had a small division, I think, based in Florida. Exactly. And Malibu Comics. And it's just it all kind of like you kind of see the dominoes, but we don't really have any proof, right? Not, nothing really. No. As yeah. As I've looked. So so something to maybe look into in the future collab. I did want to point out that like um, the the Harlock dub Harmony Gold did is a bit weird because unlike Robotech, and this is something I always try to stress to people who haven't seen Robotech because they think it's just like, oh, they mashed a bunch of things together. But really mm -hmm. what it is, is that in Robotech, they play through all of Macross and Macross is mostly intact. Then they go to Southern Cross and play through that anime just like including elements of macross as backstory it's like oh now this is 10 years later this is the next robotech war and they just reference things from the previous series yeah they're more like adding on as they go they're not like mashing them together too badly which is so weird because editing that uh harlock episode it's like now we're going to use some clean queen millennia footage this is from this this is from that it's like mixed all over the place and that's they avoided that with robotech which made the story a lot easier to follow yeah, they got a little big for their britches on this project and they wanted to push an idea that I, maybe it's just even the technology wasn't there to match it all up and make it splice, at least for the, the budget they were working in. Yeah, and I, I think I remember hearing that because they made they made 65 episodes. They did make it. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I think it aired. Like, yeah, I, I think they were writing it and producing it like as it was supposed to be coming. Out. Right. So it was like you know, real grind stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it definitely aired. People remember it, but not, not wide distribution. And, and again, we didn't get a lot of Harlock in the States, not for a long time, but let's talk about Harlock. Let's talk about the characters. Harlock, first off, Captain Harlock, the titular character of this show. Um, he had his first proper manga appearance in, uh, like John mentioned, Gun Frontier, which is a cowboy Western. Uh, he appears with his friend, uh, I will plug real quickly the first episode of this podcast. Uh, if you want to go back and check out the many faces of Captain Harlock, uh, we the dive is so deep. I know you like Gun Frontier, John. <laughs> the anime was fine. Uh, yeah, I, I to really a degree. Check out the manga. Just to, I wanted to see like how it starts off, but I I don't know much about his like what went into him before the anime. I'm I want I kind of want you to tell me. I want you to go watch that episode. Episode one. The many faces of Captain Harlock. I will link it up for everybody. Uh, the dive is too deep to go into here, but Matsumoto has been playing around with this idea for a long time. Um, and I'll talk about Matsumoto developing the idea a little bit more. Matsumoto's father was actually a, a fighter pilot in World War II. And some notable things that he flew over the Yamato as it was sunk and felt the blast wave, the shock wave of the explosion that sunk the Yamato from his plane. And he also likely sent men to their deaths as, uh, as a leader uh, amongst Japanese pilots, uh, the kamikaze pilots. And, and Matsumoto, not shy of the, the kamikaze subject either, uh, writing about it extensively. He had a lot of World War II anime, like I said, some of it featuring uh, lookalikes to Captain Harlock. Uh, you can see that in the cockpit, the animation. Basically, long story short, uh, Matsumoto's father never flies commercially or for anyone ever again. Probably some PTSD in there. PTSD, not a not a rare subject in the Liegeverse, but something more poignant about his decision never to fly again, he was offered these jobs, was his moral disposition, his ethical disposition, him being a man and saying, I will not fly for this cause anymore. I there was an error in my ways. And you get some of that with Captain Harlock in his origin story in Arcadia, My Youth, where he doesn't fly for the Illumidas after Earth loses, as uh, Harlock starts off as a uh, Earth captain in that. So a lot of different subjects there. Hopefully it made sense. But basically what I'm saying is 
Captain Harlock is a lot like Leiji Matsumoto's dad. What about Captain Harlock as a character, though? We've talked a lot about themes around Captain Harlock, but how he's drawn, how he acts, what do you guys think? I mean, he's just a character. You just take one look at him and you see pretty much what he's all about. At least that, mm -hmm. that's how I felt upon my first impression of seeing him. For me, it's um, there's this thing in writing, and I know it's something that people don't like any people don't like it anymore. But there was <laughs> it was this old mentality of a character who's a force of nature character, a character like a Sherlock Holmes or a James Bond who an an Ubermensch, so to speak. Exactly, where you you enjoy watching them just do their thing uh, and be good at it, and it's 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 entertaining, and that's yeah. kind of what I get from Harlock. He's he's someone who like never wavers. Uh, and and always seems to make the decision that is like, even if you don't agree with it, it's it's he he knows why he's doing it and he doesn't question he, he doesn't need to question it. I would say that, you know, even more modern comparisons, this was in very in fashion in the 90s when we have Die Hard, when we have Lethal Weapon, these kind of invincible cops who solve all these terrorist attacks and things like that. They're not perfect characters. Neither is Harlock, though. Right. I think I think maybe I could bring up some of Harlock's flaws. Harlock is a moral, a shameless moralizer, kind of like I said, like he looks down on everyone with disgust on Earth and not a lot of sympathy for them. And he's lost his friend. He's totally lonely. He won't really open up too much. It takes him a long time. It takes about 30 episodes to open up about anything. Tadashi Daiba kind of. It almost looks like he's going to be the protagonist of Captain Harlock's show for a little bit. Yeah, yeah uh, I 100% felt that way. Yeah, he's the son of a, of a great scientist and tries to help Harlock getting the government to realize what's going on. And that doesn't really work out for him. Headstrong kid. I, I have this later, but I will say he gets it pretty rough in the early episodes. There's, he, he's the broken in young buck, right? He's the greenhorn of the ship some he's the newbie like he fills a very specific role he fills the role of the viewer like he's being introduced to this world he's expecting so much when he joins this big ship and it's just a crew of loonies and we don't maybe look at the crew of loonies so so much in shock but like john said there weren't a lot of band of misfits shows on the air at this time a lot of these kids might have felt like tadashi at the time when they're watching this who are these freaks these are my heroes I mean, do you, was that was that possibly an issue? I, I don't know. It's weird. It's I I kind of want to know more about Yamato because I know I feel like Tadashi Daiba kind of fits that Susumu role, where like yes, he he's the guy who lost his brother and now has to go on this big journey. Uh, that's you know way way bigger the, than him. The hero's journey, right? You yeah. you lose something. You got to go on a journey to reclaim it. You're pushed out of a comfortable environment. Maybe outcast. Uh, Fume, any other thoughts on Daiba? It just kind of feels like they sort of meander on him for a little too long for my liking. I mean, when he first boards the Arcadia, he kind of sees, oh, this is just a, a band of misfits. They're not doing anything. And then, mm -hmm. you know, when they have to man their battle stations, he kind of comes to realize, oh, well, they do what they need to do when it's needed. But then after all of that, he still has that sort of fatigue of, oh, no one on this ship is doing anything. And it's like, mm -hmm. you just, it seems like you go through the same motions over and over again. And like the development it's, of the character, I think, takes a little longer than I felt it should have. It's tough to watch a crew of people who you think are ne'er-do-wells or wastrels all of a sudden jump up and perform tasks at higher skill levels than you've ever even thought you could. That's got to be a shock to the system to see that amongst in this setting, you're the incompetent one that he's got to swallow a lot of pride early on. It, it also takes him a long time to be able to properly confront them as own. Mm -hmm. something they kind of uh, dwindled on for a bit. Yeah. John, didn't you say, John, like he wakes up every day and chooses violence? Yeah. Well, and, and to be fair, there is an episode where like uh, it's like a two parter where like um, a Mazone comes aboard the ship and like psychologically tortures him. Like makes him see visions of his mother dying. Yeah, dude, he gets mind broken like every episode for the first like seven episodes or something like that. It's pretty cruel for a child. I think he's like 13, sick, something like that. 
it's pretty rough on on Tadashi. Uh, but it's even rougher on Mayu, the seven year old daughter of Harlock's best friend. We're gonna we're gonna hold on to spoilers till the end. But her father died a few years ago. You get that pretty early on. And and Mayu, like I said, is just suffering constantly. Uh, she she loves Harlock, wants to be with Harlock, can't be with Harlock, wants to go on the ship, can't be on the ship. Harlock, every time he comes down, he gets in trouble. She feels bad. She gets tortured because of Harlock. I thought it was, it felt so Rintaro, the scene mm. where um, Harlock has the letter and he's reading it and it's Mayu talking about how much she loves it and how everyone's friends with her and it's all great. But he can tell because the paper is stained that she was crying while she wrote it. Right. The, the tear stained letter. Right. That's, that's such a motif. I will say that Mayu by some is seen as a bit of a detriment to the series. I think that maybe particularly because of the Uchu curse and so much of the manga is in space, like a lot more of the manga is in space than the TV show. They're back on Earth all the time. And I think maybe they wanted something to keep the Arcadia coming back to Earth, maybe something to tie him a little bit more to make the connection between him and Earth physical instead of purely emotional like it is in the manga. Yeah, when in the first episode, he goes to visit Mayu. And I I read that when I first saw the show. I read that as this is like a special occasion. And then it's mm -hmm. like, oh, this happens like every day. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the series, yeah, pretty much. Maybe it's once a year leading up to that. But no, not after. Kayuki, who is the mandatory liege verse tall blonde on this, uh, on this show. Maytel will not be with us. For the journey, so you'll have to take Kay Yuki in the meantime. She does get a everybody gets a character episode, but they don't really dive too deep into her. And I don't know in the holy Asia verse, she never really gets her fair shake. I think I thought I thought she was fine, but I I do think it's weird she only gets one episode. Considering, I guess I'm trying to think. I don't think Yada ran well. He at least got an episode where he builds like a ship of the Arcadia. Yes. That's a, it's at least a yes. funny episode. Uh, but yeah, her backstory is like the only glimpse, you know, I, I really felt like there should have been more of that um, and not into her character period, I think is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they, yeah. they like kind of insist that like after her father's death, she kind of was like almost like a hippie kind of rebelling against the government as a young teen. And mm -hmm. I feel like there should, there could have been way more to that. Yeah. Th she's made a bit shallow. Uh, yeah. It just feels like. After her backstory episode, she's just kind of there to fulfill specific purposes. And, you know, you mm -hmm. don't really think about her after that. It's just kind of weird. They kind of they basically just kind of dropped her until, I guess, the very last episode. But again, I won't say anything. Yeah, about that. we'll hold off. But I will say in SSX, she gets a little bit more love. But that love being uh, she loves Harlock. That wasn't the deepest place to take her character. And there's been some opportunities to bring her up again, even in Galaxy Railways. Uh, if you guys have ever watched that, that's like one of the best looking Liegeverse proper animations to be made in the 21st century, I think. I think that's and, the first Liegeverse thing I watched outside of like the death. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. Cool. I, I had the Funimation channel when I was a teenager. And so that was how I watched a lot of anime. And they, they uh, Funimation dubbed Galaxy Railways and they used to play it a lot. Yeah, I loved watching it when I had a Funimation account for a short time. But I will say quickly that they have the same surname, the main character, K, I think. So uh, are you Manabo Manabu uh, Yuki Yuki? Okay. Sorry, Manabu Yuki is his last name. So it is implied in the Lazy verse that he is the, uh, I think, nephew and his mother is the sister, possibly. There's all there's always been this potential to talk more about them. And uh, she always has an important scientific father and this and that. But she she actually gets she gets her most love in the Rintaro remake, the Endless Odyssey. So if you want to know more about Kay, that's your best bet to do it, actually. So there's that. Uh, Mime, though, gets a ton of love on this show. She's the last of her alien kind. I feel like everybody's got, always got something to say about Mime. So so let it fly. Mime is my favorite character, and I can't believe <laughs> that Captain Harlock, even even if, you know, it didn't get a dub or anything, he, Captain Harlock is at least a character who is known to the wider anime collective in the West, and it is a sin that Mime is not a part of that. She's not part of the Mime-verse. The, she's not, there's not enough Mime memes. 
meme meme memes meme 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 Fume, do you want to join us? Me- <laughs> I, mean, um, I, I, I think she definitely has some of the best moments in the, I, I mean, just little one-off moments here and there. Uh, there's the one episode and, you know, I can't remember specifics, so I do apologize, but uh, where Harlock is off and they're talking about how much danger he's in and it keeps cutting back to her reactions. Like she's just utterly distraught. And I just, and just stuff like that I thought was hilarious, whether intentional or not. There, there, she has some go ahead i was gonna say there's a bunch of really subtle gags that like i can't post on twitter because you need to see them in the episode like mm-hmm. there's i i said my favorite gif is the one of her in the truck drinking where she's drinking but the reason why i find that to be the most funny is because they're going down to a planet that's known for it's like aurora borealis and she is like terrified of the at the sight of those because that's what she saw on her planet before right you know before the extinction and so she wants to be with Harlock so much that she, like, I- I'll forget it. I'll I'll go, and she gets in, but she still needs to drink, <laughs> take a drink before she, uh, yeah, witness for it. life. Well, that's another point about her character. She needs that alcohol. Uh, Matsumoto developing an alien woman to his exact liking, uh, one that's never going to be without a drink. Uh, I-, I think he's got a taste for it himself. It seems to, <laughs> it just leaks through. Uh, I also love the bit where Harlock is, I, I'll avoid spoilers this time, he's carrying the girl from the shower, and Mime like comes up behind him and she starts glowing gold as if to the sense like, now she's, she's going, going Super Saiyan. Saiyan. Yeah. It, sometimes, it, sometimes that means she's horny, sometimes it yeah. means furious. Or drunk, or yeah. It's, uh, she's feeling a lot at that point, yeah. and but it's funny at the end of the episode, you kind of just see her and she's 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 just like, I've seen a lot of you come and go, honey, but I'm going to always be here. That's kind of her role. It's it's he's a bit of a Lothario, perhaps Captain Harlock. We don't get to see it too much, but it seems like if he's around women for too long, they're going to start kissing on him other than Kay Yuki. But she's too young. She's pure. She's got to wait. But another drunk, we'll skip to the other drunk real quick, Dr. Zero. He's an alcoholic space doctor, an archetype seen in uh, space battleship Yamato. But he's a bit of a younger version here than uh, Dr. Sato, who's in Star Blazers. Drunk doctor. What do you guys think? Uh, I, I'm not, you know, I don't, I prefer not to have a drunk doctor. Um, but, Possibly, yeah. But you know what? You, it, you, take, you take what you can get. He can disinfect your wound pretty much at any time, though. He does. He does spit sake into somebody's cut at one point. <laughs> Tadashi, I believe. Yeah, he gets a good treatment from the doctor. I respect um, how ingenious he is with uh, letting his furry little friend get his alcohol for him. Yeah, uh, we'll talk more about their pets in a second, too. Uh, uh, Capitan. I think I do a pretty good Dr. Zero. Oh, Capitan. Like, I love that. Every single time he said that, it was great. Let's talk about Yadaran. Yadaran, who tragically voice actor uh, Hiroshi Itake passed away on the 1st of August, just a few days before recording this, uh, about a week before recording that. It was just uh, made public like two days ago. So uh, condolences there. And an amazing town. He also did the voice. Uh, what was the 009 voice he did? Oh, he was uh, zero, zero. I believe he was zero zero four, four. in one of yeah. in one of the movies. Yes, he was, and he was in Get a Robo, I believe. He was. I don't. Um, I don't know about Get a Robo, but I know he was in Mazinger. He was boss. Okay, okay. I think yeah, I did mess yeah, that he up. Was, so he was, Ko- he was Koji Kabuto's uh, burly friend. Yes, yes. I think I got those characters mixed up because I haven't watched enough of that stuff. But yes, a wonderful character, the first mate on the Arcadia assistant to captain harlock and in real life yadaran was based off of uh Heiaru shintani and he was the assistant of Liji matsumoto uh he assembled a lot of reference models actually for the manga illustrations matsumoto did you know doing so much world war ii anime specifically he was always making these models so i can imagine that uh shintani was basically acting like this a lot in the in the studio oh don't bother me i'm working on this model right now i'm busy i'm busy uh master i think yadaran's a really fun character um mm-hmm. you know being 
conditioned by previous anime. I was waiting for them to do a storyline, maybe when I first started watching it, waiting for them to do a storyline where he realizes he has to put model kit making aside and take things seriously. <laughs> but no. I was glad that by the end <laughs> that they just like, no, that's his mm -hmm. character. And yep. the episode where they get him to uh, build the fake Arcadia, Arcadia model kit. I'm trying not to spoil the episode, but right. I, I guess I guess I, I guess I can give the basic plot where the the villains you basically challenge him to build a, a model of the Arcadia, and then they yeah, there's a contest, sabotage Harlock basically. Yeah, they know everything about the Arcadia because of a, a model that Yatteron builds for them. It's it's very mild spoiler. I, I just thought that was funny because I said I tweeted that that was just such a silly plot for an episode, and someone pointed out that that has actually happened in real life where model kit model enthusiasts have worked to leak actual military designs so that they can make their <laughs> models more accurate <laughs> that's beautiful that's absolutely beautiful to know that's uh the passion is real yadaran is is not a figment of somebody's imagination that otaku spirit was alive and well uh there, during that time there was one where they found out like a military base had been perfectly recreated in minecraft and, <laughs> and they found out that, that that was how they found out it got leaked Another interesting fact about Shintani uh, created Area 88 and Roy, uh, not Roy, uh, the main character of Area 88 looks a lot like the drawings of Captain Harlock uh, or the iterations thereof that led to Captain Harlock in these old fighter planes that Matsumoto used to draw all the time. So Harlock inspires Area 88. And then I speculate very hardly, uh, very, very strongly on this, that uh, Roy Fokker from Macross, after learning from John's video, uh, Macross was originally a parody, right? Yeah, there was a they uh, the company that was sponsoring it one didn't think a serious drama would catch on, and so they they pitched a comedy and were like, yeah, it'll be like a parody of Gundam, and they were like, oh, that's perfect, do a lot of yeah, and they basically said do do a lot of parodies, make it make it a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of like, and so there's a lot of character analogs to previous Mecha that become their own as the show goes on. But there's mm -hmm. still some stuff, especially in those first first three episodes. I would say even four, because episode four, infamous giant tuna in space, feels like something from the parody <laughs> scripts. Um, right. Yeah, so there's a lot of analogs to other characters from Mecha and, and space opera shows. Right, and so my speculation is that Roy Fokker looks a lot like the protagonist from Area 88, uh, a lot like him. Yeah. And so you can see a clear lineage of Harlock going from this anime to Macross. Yeah. And it's funny because I, in my video, I only used information that was like from the source. And according mm -hmm. to the, the source, Nobor Noboru Ishiguro, who directed the series, said that they based Roy Fokker off of Slager Law from Gundam. And mm -hmm. I believe character wise in his personality, he's kind of a a rugged man, a womanizer, you know, right. based off like those 70s action stars, kind of. That, yeah, his personality is definitely based off Slager Law, but mm -hmm. design-wise, they don't mention it, but I do see that so when, when someone pointed it out to me, saying, hey, that looks like the guy from Area 88, and I looked it up myself, and I was like, they never mentioned that, but I definitely see it. Right, quick, because uh, it just popped in my head. Area 88, is that the manga that you win Squadron on the Super Nintendo's? Yes. On? Okay, yeah, because yes. I because I love that good point. Game. I've I've never read Area eighty eight, but I knew it sounded familiar. Uh, no, but yeah. uh, Yadaran, I I think personally he's the most interesting character aboard the crew uh, as far as how you know the characters are all portrayed in this particular anime. Uh, I one thing I love that I think is kind of understated is the interactions he has with Harlock. Like Harlock will be like first mate, we need you. Oh, well, I'm, I'm working on this right now. And then he's like, oh, well, guess it can't be helping. He kind of shrugs it off. Yeah, he's cool with it most of the time, it seems like. I feel like he knows if Yadaran's not interested, it doesn't need to be done. He has a lot of faith in his crew. That's like one of the like he'd probably kill any of them without a second thought if they did the wrong thing. But when it comes to them doing the right thing, he's got total faith that that's, it's just going to work out in everybody. And let's talk about the some of the rest of the crew real quick. Maji, chief engineer, a uh, bit of a Leiji Matsumoto insert there. Y you could also say that another character is a bit of a Matsumoto insert, but we needed one for the whole series. Chief engineer, the Arcadia, 
Uh, Miss Masu, the ornery kitchen matriarch. She's always chasing around these animals on the Arcadia with her with two knives screaming at the top of her lungs. Uh, those two animals being Tori San, the bird, and Mikun, the cat. That's Dr. Zero's cat and based off of Liaji Matsumoto's cat, which he constantly is buying the same looking cat and calling it Mikun. So that's a thing he died, but he hasn't bought a new one yet from this. I guess there were like eight generations after the last one died. I had a neighbor that did that same thing because I, rem- I, I remember talking to my mom recently and my neighbors have a dog named Heidi. And I was like, they've had that dog since I was like five years old. <laughs> no, like, they, my mom's like, they've had 11 dogs. <laughs> You might want to ask that neighbor if they're writing like a, a sci fantasy epic by chance, but are they world creating in some way? That seems like a very obsessive behavior. I'll just put it that way. They, they are they are elderly and don't even know how to use smartphones, so I don't think they are. <laughs> we don't know. He could have manuscripts. You'd be you're, surprised. You're right. He could be stowing those away. <laughs> yeah. I really want to throw it up. Like, let's talk about the rest of the crew. Any other things uh, come to mind, Fume? Uh, Maji, I think, is another case kind of like K, uh, where, you know, we, we see his backstory and then he's just kind of off in the mm-hmm. distance. Like we don't really see much out of him, but I think it's even more extreme with him because we don't really see much of him prior to his backstory episode either. Like he just sort of, you know, shows up, has his time in the spotlight and, you know, we just really never see him again. He only has like, you know, one episode and yeah, he gets a little more play towards the end after his episode, because I feel like maybe they started to understand his character. And he's leveraged as like he's leveraged a lot at the end, like right at the end. But that's spoilers. Well, with Maji, it's funny because his he he kind of has like two episodes because um, he has yeah. the one that talks about his wife and his daughter. And then there's a second one. And the first one that, that tells his backstory, I think, is a very good episode. The second one is really weird. Um, and I, I mentioned this in a video that he, his daughter's name is Midori and her hair is green. Midori means green. So I get I get makes sense. Perfect. Makes mm-hmm. sense. Second episode, her name is still Midori, but her hair is red. And then there were a bunch of other things in that episode. They go to a planet. It's full of green babies. Didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a little it's a little creepy there. The weird green babies for Tori San. I did want to mention that that is what vicious's bird is based off of in mm-hmm. cowboy bebop and there's actually a lot of cowboy bebop comparisons right before yep. this i tweeted an image and i'm trying to find the best way to convey that let's let's hold that to the references we're okay. going to get to a whole references section okay. so but you're absolutely right you're absolutely right but we've talked a lot about our general impressions here let's have a little bit of freestyle conversation about it i will say one thing that i really noticed about the show the recaps especially early on are super unique. One thing, uh, episode six, they show this uh, footage from the last episode, but you get all these different angles and that's not totally new, but you're watching it happen again and you kind of zoom out after it happens and you realize you're watching security episode, uh, security footage from what had just happened at the end of the last episode. I think that those kind of little detailed touches to me, that just spells genius. Did anybody else notice those? I didn't, but my argument is that uh, the reason why I didn't is because I actually started the series like a year and a half ago and then like, uh, I yeah. had a break and picked it up again. The earlier parts of the series, like I said, I rewatched episode one because mm-hmm. I wanted to basically yeah. refresh myself on that. But those earlier episodes, I'm less familiar with. I, I didn't really particularly notice the intros, but I guess it was just kind of something that I- you know, wasn't really thinking about as I was. You'd normally glaze over them anyways, right? right? Like you're thinking this is just old anime filler, but they surprise you a few times, especially early on. Uh, I'm just kind of so used to just sort of turning my brain off during recaps and yeah. back on when we get into the episode proper. Mm-hmm. So, and I never really noticed anything like that. But I, what I did notice was, and I mean, we touched on it a little earlier, but that there's a plethora of very stylized shots like episode nine had a really good one. And I was just watching that before we started. Uh, That's how I remembered that. And there's the one episode where I think it's episode 30 or 31, if I remember right, but uh, I know I'm a rainbow planet. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The, the very important episodes will say that. Yeah. 
that one had a really cool sequence, but I don't really want to. Well, let's let's get into criticisms. Why not? Yeah, I so again, this could just be mis- be misremembering, but early on, it was hard to tell like how many people know about the Mazone. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, Daiba's dad is is gonna tell people, and it's like you can't tell anyone, and it was unclear like. Does Harlock already know about these people? Does is the government yes. aware and trying to hide it? Yeah, a, a lot of the times they weren't playing by the rules that they had seen yeah. established. Like a with, lot with the Mazone in particular, you know, they they sort of established that oh, they're all beautiful women, but you know, we see some like again, episode nine. There's a museum curator who is a Mazone, but he's obviously not a beautiful woman. Uh, mm. and, you know, there are some other stuff that again, I don't want to spoil but yeah i mean who's the later half i'll bring up some more examples before we talk about who's to blame and why maji runs into the mazone uh masu runs into the mazone they all all these all these characters run in the mazone before the sphere hits earth and it does just seem like harlock doesn't know who the mazone are but by the end of the episode it's like he's known about them for a long time and this is why he was worried about earth but i don't know if anybody else got that sense but but i mean who are we to blame here i, I think the only person to blame is rintaro maybe rintaro's not the biggest stickler for these kind of continuity details maybe that's why he works better as a movie guy maybe that's why he got his fame is notoriousness from his movie works the the best comparison i can give it is it feels like they're making they're making up the continuity as they go, like episode to episode. Yeah. It's kind of there's a lot of stuff like this. I noticed rewatching Inuyasha of all things. Oh God, there's stuff where it's like, oh, uh, the the jewel the jewel breaks into shards in the second episode or whatever, and then are you? I just like I'm thinking of words that I have to say: spiraling, never ending, fever dream. <laughs> well, the 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 jewel breaks into shards in like episode two or three, and then yeah. The the whole the entirety of the show is set over the court within one year. And yet they meet characters in the first season, which you'd have to imply is only make weeks after, who are like, I've had held on to this jewel shard for a for yes. a very long time. Mm-hmm. So like since Tuesday or <laughs> that 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 was what Harlock was reminding me of was yep. it was the rewatch of Inuyasha where the continuity is being made as they go along. Yeah. And beyond the Mazone, the first Tokargan we see is like a no necked, like half spheroid headed alien okay, with like no mouth that we can see. I, I saw your note and I didn't know what a Tokargan is, but yeah, <laughs> that, that bugged the hell out of me because the, the, he's like a weird. I, I remember thinking like, wow, this doesn't this feel he's such a weird alien guy. And then so so real quick, real quick, the Tokargans for context are the slave race of the Mazone. Uh, you see this a lot in Yamato, where the Garmalos have taken over all these different planets, right? And they have civilizations, all these civilizations under them. And the Tokargans represent this one, right? So that, for context, go ahead. Yeah, and and I, I this is another thing that I tweeted about because he's like, uh, he has no nose. He's like this weird alien dude. He feels like he feels like a He-Man action figure in anime form, basically. Mm-hmm. And then like it's only like two episodes later that. He's like, oh, he was he was my father. And I'm like, I had to look it up because I'm like, you can't, you're you're an ordinary human. <laughs> There's no way you mean the the no-nosed <laughs> goblin. Yeah. Man. Yep. Another one. The crew of 40 that they have, which uh I didn't mention this, probably based on the 40 thieves, Alibaba and the 40 thieves, I believe. That that's what I would suggest. But uh that that number never changes, even after we watch somebody die on the crew. And it's not really, this isn't a big spoiler at all. Like somebody dies right in front of us, Swiss cheese, there's still a crew 40. No problems. And that guy's never buried. Meanwhile, they're just taking people out into space in their hands without anything and wrapped in a flag and just letting them out. That that person would be vacuum crushed viscera out there. <laughs> But she's a beautiful Mazone, so maybe she doesn't have any orifices. You know what? I what do you guys think? Uh, I think that Mazones do have orifices. I will argue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. The important things. And uh, Mime and Harlock they met in a between a three year period of of uh, 
Harlock's friend dying and the Mazone appearing. So when did that happen? That's another kind of sketchy thing. They only got to meet like within the last three years. So that's something to think about, too. Uh, I mean, the, the Togagan stuff, that was yeah. really the uh, the biggest problem to me. Or I don't know if I should say problem, but the biggest sort of inconsistency. I was like, why? Mm-hmm. How, how come when Zol first appears and, you know, he's got his other warriors attacking the Arcadia? Why is that the only time they look like that? Like that was because it's thing that sort of bothered me because it's easier for the staff to animate a human. Yeah. I would I would guess, even though there's less facial features, I feel like there was something about this alien that was just like, I feel like Rintaro was under a lot of stress. <laughs> also, there's a lot of anticipation because when Harlock takes Zol back to have a drink with him, you know, he's just holding that wine glass for so long. And I remember when I first watched this anime seven years ago, I was at the edge of my seat being like, how is this motherfucker going to drink? That? I'm, I'm sorry. Pardon my friend. Uh, <laughs> no, you're fine. How is he going to? We were talking about Mazone Orifice. Sorry, that's, go. that's true. Yeah, but I was just like, "How's he gonna drink it?" Like he and he just keeps staring at the wine glass. It's like the animators knew that this was such a stupid situation. And still, like, like he just and then he just drinks they get it. rid of the mouth. You get rid of the mouth, thinking all of our problems are gone, and it just makes things worse. You should have kept. You gotta get rid of the neck and keep. Get rid of the mouth and keep the neck, like Mimi. I was gonna say, yeah, like with Mimi, like she doesn't like. You can imply like maybe like it opens up. Or it passes through like a forest <laughs> surface. Yeah. The dude has like a turtleneck thing over his face. <laughs> it's rough. He's got a Liegeverse collar, though, and that's important. And the only other criticism I was going to mention was where I already kind of talked about it the, the spaceship animation, the battles are disjointed. It's kind of disinteresting. And this was before uh, Katsumi Itabashi had joined on with all the Liegeverse animation moving forward. And I think the the quality jump in uh, spaceship drawings overall goes up a lot. Probably my last criticism will be uh, the final fight between Lafragia and and Harlock. Like it's not a well animated fight in my opinion. It's really choppy no. and really mm-hmm. weirdly angled, and to the point that I actually thought that it was a fake out. I was like, oh, this is this is going to be another because like she does fake outs before where like they they shoot her and then it turns out it was oh it was a decoy or something. And so mm-hmm. I was really surprised that that was how they ended off the series. Yeah, I think especially with that that climax, uh, without giving out spoilers, though, I do think the the atmosphere leading up to that is 10 out of 10. I pretty much agree with what both of you are saying uh, in terms of uh, especially that final confrontation with Lafrisia. That was very awkward to watch and yeah. kind of anticlimactic. But I will say the Arcadia having a blade that just comes out and you just ram into shit. Uh, I think that's cool as fuck. <laughs> Not much of a criticism there, but yes, we all agree. <laughs> Ramming blade is fucking awesome. So, but the, it does speak to the quality of the series, especially for the time. It, it, there's so much good about it that even when it's low, even, even though it's really, really low, sometimes I think the highs are still higher. Let's talk about references. You want to talk about Cowboy Bebop, John, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, you know, I I I knew because I had seen Tori the bird as like a mascot character around, and I immediately was like, oh yeah, that's Vicious's bird from Cowboy Bebop. But it's interesting watching the series and seeing a lot more parallels. Um, I even pointed out on Twitter just now that the the final episode of Harlock is titled "Farewell Space Outlaw," which is the very mm. a space cowboy. Yes. And even Harlock feels has a very Spike Spiegel feel to him, including mm. the fact that they're both missing an eye. I think they're even both missing the same eye. And they were both voiced by Steve Bloom at one point, at least. That's true, too. Yeah, I think you're, that, that uh, comparison is not lost on you. I think there's an entire article somewhere online about uh, Cowboy Bebop and Liege Matsumoto specifically. Uh, so go go look that up if, if you're ever interested. I didn't even read the whole thing, but definitely uh, a lot of influence there. Some other references I noticed Star Trek and its metaphors. It's like putting too much air in a balloon. We get a lot of that, a lot of uh, sci fi sci fi intrigue in a sci fantasy show, which is a bit different. It's a bit uh, unique. And another one. But sometimes it gets lost in like translation. Like uh, one episode, Yadaran compares a maneuver of the Arcadia 
to the behavior of a sucking fish. Now, I don't know what a sucking fish is, so that went over my head. And what I saw them do after that wasn't what I thought a sucking fish might do. Anybody else notice any good metaphors? Star, Star Trek, uh, things like that. Star Trek references in general. I am uncultured swine, so any of yeah, same would go over my head. I know it mostly because Futurama talks about Star Trek metaphors. Well, another reference I noticed, though, was uh, anybody ever watched Thunderbirds or Go? I loved Thunderbirds or Go. And I think as a kid, all those vehicles, especially like the drill vehicles, they're used and utilized and the shots are set up in such a way that really reminds me of Thunderbirds or Go. Any, anybody know what I'm talking about here? Oh, yeah. Is, yeah. In fact, I know. I mean, a lot of anime tried to replicate that. I mean, even Cyborg 009 has the uh, the dolphin ship, which has mm-hmm. these little they have like a, the nose of it can deploy into a helicopter. There's an undercarriage that can deploy to a drill to go underground. Um, and it all feels very Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds was huge in Japan. Yeah. Thunderbirds. Is that like the weird super marionation? Yes. Thing? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's yeah all and I know about it. <laughs> the it biggest makes me unsettled. <laughs> yes yes it for some reason it did that to me as a kid but it also intrigued me enough where i couldn't stop looking at it and what i noticed most about it are just how long and slow and methodical some of these car shots are it's like they did it because it was super marionation but then they do it in anime too and it's just it's too stilted to seem deliberate you know, even they're it just the, the influence seems really clear. Did anybody else kind of notice that when they especially they've got the drill vehicle and they're out in the situation like they're getting covered in an avalanche. Right. That's a really Thunderbirds or go sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And a, and a lot of if you look up a lot of mech designers from that era, like even like the Macro staff always talked about Thunderbirds was like a big uh, influence on them. Yeah. So and I think the, there were a lot of toy selling episodes and efforts made here. I think. I, going back to criticism, I will say that I think a lot of the mechanical designs aren't as cool as what we generally see in the Liege verse in Yamato and after in like Galaxy Express. I'm what do you guys think about like the, me- the mech design here? The stuff that's not super in the manga, too. And basically, I'll tell you, that's pretty much everything that's not a Mazone ship or an Arcadia. Did you guys notice a big difference between the design of those ships and every other ship? No, I, I do know that Studio Nue, who I, I believe also did the mech designs for Yamato, are credited on the manga. I don't know if are if I don't know what design specifically. I don't know. Do you know what's on which which manga? Oh, uh, the Captain Harlock manga. Oh, okay. I would have to look into that. I don't know much about the Harlock because uh... uh, Studio Nue is the um they're the mech design studio that did Macross, but they also um I believe worked on Space Battleship Yamato. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That would make sense. It would make a lot of sense. I don't think Yamato gets as off source material because Matsumoto designed all of it. Like, I don't think Matsumoto designed all these other ships. I think that's what I'm saying. Like, can you guys see a difference between the blocky, like, fighter pilots and the the auxiliary ships and what Matsumoto... Am I the only one who feels this way? That maybe they were a little bit simplified. Maybe they were trying to fit a mold that had worked for other toys in the past. Well, I don't Does know. That... Did, uh, did Harlock have like a toy sponsor? I don't know if they. Yes. They, did. they were definitely selling toys. There were a lot of Harlock toys around this time. And well, I know that the auxiliary vehicles that I'm talking about got toys. Okay. Like there is a toy of the, I forget what they're called. They're numbered, right? It's like number four, space vehicle number four or something like that. That was turned into a toy. It just seemed a bit off to me, uh, but that may just be me. What else to say? In episode 28, there's a child named Ikaru who looks like Mowgli from Jungle Book. Anybody notice that? Oh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, DeviantArt has kind of ruined that character. So. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I'm not. I don't want to go down that path. You um, may not want to Google that character in DeviantArt. Mowgli? <laughs> yeah, Mowgli. Uh, <laughs> Mowgli got a bad rap. Let's move on. Uh, and Mayu, pleasantly, is a lot of her episodes are based on Japanese fairy tales. And Matsumoto does this just a lot in general. I don't know if you guys know much about Japanese fairy tales or notice, notice much of that in this series. Some of the earliest sci-fi works 
are Japanese fairy tales. I will say that. In the Moon Princess, there's aliens that come down to Earth and uh, hook up with royal or create royalty. That's kind of like ancient alien theory that we'll talk about later. And so, and I know with Yamato, because um, I passively through other stuff I've done, I know that even just like the core concept of they're on a journey somewhere is inspired by Journey to the West. Yeah, Journey to the West. And there's some Jason and the Argonauts in there, too, uh, for Yamato specifically. Yeah, definitely a lot of Japanese fairy tales. And the only other reference, well, speaking of Yamato, right? They blow up the Yamato like three times at least, or, or at least two times. The first episode, it's very clear the Yamato is basically raises from the grave. We'll put it that way. And they got to put it down. And then another time in episode 31, the SDF blows up a ship and it looks a lot like the Yamato from afar. It's got a lot of the lines and curves that you notice as kind of that real live battleship turned into a spaceship and it just gets blown up. Yeah. I think this might have been Leiji Matsumoto responding a little bit to a rocky relationship with Yoshinobu Nishizaki uh, after a tenuous creation of uh, three seasons of Yamato. Uh, I 100 percent believe it. Uh, I know that like they, they did not get along very well. And I know. uh they even, I think at one point they even scrubbed Nishizaki's name off the series because I, I think he got caught with drugs or something. He was like, yes, he was caught with uh, firearms as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And doesn't Nishizaki, I believe he speaks fluent English, actually. And I would believe it. Yeah. And, and I think he actually helped pitch Star Blazers um, in America because he could speak English, which mm -hmm. I guess comes in handy if you're, you know, running guns and drugs. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he wasn't really successful in life other than Yamato, from what I can tell. Uh, he lost some of Tezuka's money before this, and then he almost lost the Yamato money because it almost got canceled. And basically, the, the, the strife between Matsumoto and Yoshi, Yoshinobu Nishizaki is basically that of, like, the artist versus... He's kind of a tight ass, like he's, but he's kind of like rebel tight ass. You see him in a in a leather jacket riding a motorcycle. I don't want to get too deep into Yamato, but the beef was real. Like one time Matsumoto asked if Yoshinobu Nishizaki was colorblind during the creation of a cartoon. That's that's a pretty hard insult. I would I would figure at that point. Let's let's get to the juicy stuff. Unless anybody else had anything else they want to talk about before we get into spoilers. Any other spoiler free content you want to talk about? No, I need We're, to get the spoilers now. Spoil me. Our lock dies. Sorry. <laughs> i don't know maybe well it's 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 like super implied right it's like the end of a life towards the no, end I'm, of the I'm series right everyone. <laughs> I, yeah i'm trying to turn your troll into actual actual discussion though okay. because there is a serious departure when captain harlock leaves the arcadia and he basically leaves everybody but his alien babe and his spaceship and they leave. They go off to do. I mean, this is kind of a brutal ending, but I think it comes back to that that theme of the duty of loneliness. To me, it's bittersweet, but it makes sense. I thought it was perfect because yeah, he tell he tells Daiba and Kay, uh, and he's he's like, you need to follow your own path. Your path isn't to be you know work for me your whole lives. You have mm -hmm. your own things you have to accomplish. You have your own paths to walk. Go and do it. And it feels like of all the people in his crew, it, it's actually good that like everyone gets to do their own thing. But Mime also gets what she wants, which is to be alone with Harlow. <laughs> it, it's the perfect ending where everyone gets what they needed. Yeah. She's like, I ain't going nowhere. I'm staying. I don't know what. Yeah. But it's important, though, because there's an ulterior motive, especially with context of Kay and Tadashi Daiba. And it's a bit of a uh, the flood is over. Repopulate the earth situation going on. Maybe not specifically with those two, though it is implied. Uh, but I will say, he says often leading up to the, the climax, he's talking to the government and saying, at least spare the young ones. Let the young ones no longer be criminals in the eyes of the international government. And he's saying that very specifically because he wants the flowers to grow where they haven't grown for a while again. The earth has been kind of, we didn't really talk about this too much. The earth, for the most part, there's a lot of slums. Like there's the place where everybody lives happy and content. And then there's just hell 
everywhere else on this earth. And he wants to fix that. And that's what he believes he's doing by letting his crew go off back onto the earth. Well, I I was just going to say in regards to the ending, I thought it was probably the most logical conclusion it could all come to because everybody aboard the crew has to sort of bring all their talents and skills together to bring bring down the seemingly insurmountable threat of the Mazone. But once all that's taken care of, it's like they're the only ones really capable of Mm -hmm. rebuilding the Earth. To me, that all made sense. That was really all I felt about it. I didn't think it was, uh, you know, I, I mean, maybe it was a little brutal, but at the same time, I just I felt it made the most sense. I think in a lot of anime, uh, Tamino comes to mind. You're you're getting your endings a little too gratuitously brutal. And I think that you're saying this is the perfect blend of sweet and sour, right? Exactly. Yeah, it ends fantastically. And and that's kind of rare in anime, I think, especially around this time. Some other spoilers. Uh, Tadashi Daibo, we could talk a little bit more about him. His uh, father dies, uh, is killed by the Mazone, uh, along with his father's African professor friend, who we didn't really talk much about. He's got like a single name. Cusco. Cusco. Okay, great. Excellent memory. Excellent callback. Yeah. And that's why he's on board. So he's got that hate boner, (laughs) for lack of a better term, for the Mazone specifically because of this. And it makes him kind of an idiot throughout most of the show. And then he wants to kill him, but then he wants to fuck him. And he wants to kill him, and then he wants to fuck him. And he can't make up his mind. And that's kind of like the story of adolescence, maybe? I don't know. It's a really a coming-of-age story for Tadashi Daiba. It certainly is a coming of something. <clears throat> Anyways, orifices. Uh, in the Mazone, it ends up, they gave man technology. And this is, I don't know what, what you guys know about ancient alien theory, or new age themes, especially uh, between the 70s and the 80s, but it was kind of a kind of a big deal. This was all these kind of hokey ideas were taking off in a in a really big way. And Matsumoto buys a hook, hook line and singer a sinker in his personal life. He owns like meteors, and uh, he's he's very into uh, collecting this type of alien esoterica. What do you guys know about ancient alien theory and? Uh, and the themes that are here in the show. Well, the perfect timing. This was not planned, but I've actually been writing a, a an article about th- this intrigue into ancient civilizations and how it affected, especially robot anime in the mm-hmm. late seventies. Because, um, and I can even well, uh, I'll have the editor for the video version of this. I can just give you a collage of episodes of mecha anime from all different series where they'll open an episode on the Nazca lines. Stonehenge, Moai heads, and, mm-hmm. and, and everything, all, all the aliens, suddenly they go from having either giant robots to now they're, they, they're in UFOs now. Everyone was in a UFO. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, the, UFO the, gr- Grandizer? UFO is that what you're going to say? Grandizer, exactly. Yeah. 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 So it was a hugely influential thing on, on anime in that era. In fact, uh, Tomino, you, you mentioned Tomino, he's, uh, Brave Rydeen, uh, it's a giant robot that, unlike other robots, was a weapon from an ancient civilization, which I suspect, and I write in my article, I believe was a huge influence on his later work, Ideon, uh, mm. where the robot is this this old weapon left over from an ancient civilization. Harlock hits right when that was at its peak, so clearly, clearly falling in line with a lot of shows of that era. Fume, thoughts on uh, on the same topic there? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not too privy on ancient alien theories, yeah. so I watch I really watch some know. of a watch some of Action Bronson Bronson's walk. He he had one of the original watch alongs on on mainstream television, and uh, is it's great. I suggest it. Ancient Aliens right. with Action Bronson. It's a bit of a troll, but not really. And you also get in this show. Uh, there's a laser cannon in the Sphinx, and there are pyramids on the surface of the ocean floor in the Bermuda Triangle. So these are all very in line with kind of the topics you you reinforced uh, and the examples you brought up, John. Also, ancient alien theory. Let's talk about the Arcadia. I think that's the biggest spoiler of the whole show, right? It's what I identify as a ghost ship motif. I don't know if anybody else picked up on that. 
Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, that's that's a huge thing in Ishinomori's work. It's funny because um, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Message from Space, the knockoff Japanese Star Wars, basically. Oh no. Yeah, it's it's a it's a to it's a Toei slash MGM sci fi movie from like 1979 or 1980, totally made to capitalize on the success of Star Wars. Um, mm-hmm. And it was like their most their highest budget film they had made up until that point. And it has designs by Shotaro Ishinomori. But it's funny because I I remember watching it and going, I wonder if I could pinpoint which designs were by Ishinomori. And then the ghost ship in space comes out. And I'm like, there you go. Because <laughs> uh, there's that. There's literally an anime, um, and it was also based on a manga called The Flying Phantom Ship. Same idea. Uh, Akumizer 3 also has a ghost ship. Other ones I can't think of exactly now, but yeah, he uses ghost ships all the time. So the the Flying Dutchman story apparently got to three of Japanese, uh, Japan's biggest animation maniacs, as they called themselves. Uh, yes. Ishinomori, Liji Matsumoto, and Asuma Tezuka. Um, I wonder what Asuma Tezuka's ghost ship is like. I can't imagine he doesn't have one. But you do kind of see, I wouldn't be surprised. Does it? Does Ishinomori's ghost ship have like that really fanciful galleon back end? He does it more like it's a, um, uh, it's it's usually a traditional ghost ship on the exterior. Um, and then on the inside, it's mechanical. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, it also becomes a bit of a summonable trump card. I don't know if there's a name for this role in anime. I know what you mean. Summonable. Like the, the hero that will always come in in the last second. Uh-huh. Just when, when Harlock's about to be defeated, he just starts going, oh, what is it? Tomoyo. Tomoyo. <laughs> Totoro, do you mean? Or is that the name for friend? Is that friend? My, my friend. He starts saying, yes. my friend. My friend. What is it again? I think it's Tomoyo. Tomoyo. Okay. We'll double check. I'll double check. Uh, at the beginning of every episode. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, that's what they told me. Or Mayu goes father. Totoro, we're spoiled that. Totoro is Captain Harlock's friend, as most of you should know already. And Totoro, in this two episode sort of mini story, it depicts Harlock and Totoro, who are apparently already friends on a Western style planet. We get the uh, quintessential intro to the small cloaked and hatted character where they walk into a bar order milk uh, uh, or or food of some sort be belittled for not just getting a damn beer and then they proceed to get the tar kicked out of them and then they're saved by Harlock or it's been Emeraldus before as well so this is a very famous scene you, you've seen it in Galaxy Express 3.9 right? Oh, oh yeah. yeah yeah it's in it's in a lot if there's a child or a, or a Totoro and they, you get a first introduction to one of them in a lazy verse, it's probably going to be, and they're a boy, they're going to be in that situation. It's, uh, it's, it's used quite a bit. But they have that happen. And there's a bit of a continuity error with this, though, because Totoro dies right at the end of this two-episode story. And then somehow he's in the Arcadia. But in, you don't understand really how it happened. You understand really clearly in Galaxy Express because he pulls a lever and then like there's a light show. But what happened here? Apparently they put some brain cells in there. Does that mean that there were two Totoros at one point? I Part of me wonders if the original idea was that like his soul, because he built the ship, his soul like beyond science uh, mm-hmm. his soul was attached to the ship that way. Because I, I, because because they tell you it's in the computer before the flashback, I imagine that we would just get another version of the Galaxy Express three nine scene because I've seen Galaxy Express Express three nine before, and that's yeah. not come up. And so nope. I, I'm like I was, I was also waiting for them to possibly reveal that that was like a fake out death, and then you see, mm-hmm. him but like him and Emeraldus are not in the show very much at all, really. Ah, ah, Emeraldus isn't in the show at all. Emeralda is and let's talk a little bit about emeralda fume did you have anything to add before we before we talk about emeralda uh not really i just i had the same question you did uh like how his will or his soul or whatever you would call it ended up in the arcadia that was kind of yeah a, a point of confusion for me as well yeah and it ties in really well to galaxy express like you see all these ideas matsumoto has and by the middle of the 80s he's got it perfected unfortunately by that time nobody really cares anymore it's kind of sad 
But we will, let's talk about Emerelda. That's not Emeraldis. And there's a few good reasons why. Firstly, you get a different costume, right? She's got this uh, Western costume with a knife in the shoulder sort of belt. And she's wearing a big hat. And this is actually, John, you watched with me, Cosmo Warrior Zero, right? We see that this outfit actually get referenced later on. Any thoughts on the outfit? <laughs> and how it contrasts what we know Emeraldus as today. It's a good fit. Uh, needs skull and crossbones. Exactly. I didn't get the vibe that this was an alien because Emeraldus in the Legionverse is the sister of Maytel, who is an alien. And Maytel's mother looks like Queen Lafresia. So you're kind of piecing together how all these ideas like kind of evolved and changed. But Emeraldus isn't an alien or is she? Was she supposed to be a Mazone in the end that maybe was converted by Totoro's love? So There's other ginger Mazone, too. So you kind of uh, now I need to rethink a lot of things. So uh, in my brain, I was reading the subs as Emeraldus. Yes. So, it, nope. So that is a different character. Well, if you look on Anime News Network, it's listed as an error. Oh, it should be Emeraldus. I don't think so. I think they deliberately, and I can hear it in the dub. They're saying Emerelda. Well, it uh, could be an error in that Luigi Matsumoto later changed the name. Well, no, because the Queen Emeraldus uh, manga existed before this. And Queen Emeraldus, let's get to this now. It's not Queen Emeraldus, by the way. It's just Emeraldus, but it's Emeralda. Emeralda is Emeraldus in the manga. But she appears to Harlock on Death Shadow Island. He's in the water. She comes up off the shoreline or something like that. It might be vice versa, but she's completely nude. And she says, Harlock, give yourself to me. And Harlock just shoots her on spot. And it was a Mazone. And he basically goes, you could never have been Emeraldus because Emeraldus loved my friend and would never betray her love. She would never stop loving him. And in this, in the, in the anime, she, sh she shows up on Death Shadow Island and Harlock is with Totoro and they're both naked in the water. And Emeraldus is uh, the clothed one. I don't know if any of that made sense. <laughs> I hope it did. Let me know if it didn't. But I think it's very interesting what they did here. Uh, but basically that Emeraldus uh, appearance in the manga was a promotion for the simultaneously running Queen Emeraldus manga. <laughs> uh, that's a lot to take in. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm not so, really familiar with a lot of the other works. So. What, what was the most confusing part of that to you? Did any of it make sense or no? No, it, it made sense. It's just that that's a lot to think about that. I mean, I mean, obviously, I wasn't thinking about it at the time because I'd never mm -hmm. read the manga, so I didn't have a, a basis of comparison. And I I read it as Emeraldus, you know, when I was watching the subtitles because I'm just used to her being Emeraldus. But now I'm just kind of and now the possibility of her being a Mazone, I, I think there is a, I think there's some legitimacy to that because uh, well, we see Shizuka Namino who has a very similar appearance to uh, to Emeralda. Yeah, I, I actually saw screenshots of her as a character and genuinely thought that there was a whole, a whole arc where Emeralda joins the crew. Uh, yeah. I was very confused watching those episodes with a completely different perspective. Well, another reason why I don't think she's Emeraldus is because of how she leaves the series. Instead of bucking up and raising her daughter and fighting for the universe, she decides to follow her husband's corpse through space until she dies, I guess. Well, if, if she's not Emeraldus and she's not Mayu's mother, then. Well, she is Mayu's mother. She okay. is Mayu's mother in that. But she's I'm saying that she doesn't manifest the qualities of Emeraldus in a lot of different ways. And so I think that Matsumoto might have even been like, this isn't Emeraldus. Like you took this little moment from the manga and tried to spin it into this whole backstory. And you tried to make Emerald as a Mazone, and you got to change that now. Like speculation. I speculate all the time, but I could see all of this happening, right? Like it's not too far removed from something that could have happened. I think there's merit to it, certainly. Yeah. She's, a, she's an interesting little side note in this whole anime. But I was going to say Totoro is my favorite Legiverse character, and Yadaran is basically like. My friend died and I found Yadaran and he's you're my replacement new best friend. 
that's a little bit of what Yadaran is. It's a little brutal to say it, but it ain't too far from the truth. Yeah, I never thought about that, but yeah, I think that's part of why he took him on or could be. Yeah, well, if you see and if you watch Cosmo Warrior Zero, where Totoro and Yadaran both exist in the same universe, they ne- they like never interact. It's almost like when you have two really good friends and like one friend's jealous of the other or vi- or you have a friend that's, you know, and it's just like an awkward vibe when they're all in the same room. Yeah, that's pretty much all I had. <laughs> I mean, we went pretty hard. I appreciate you both. Uh, putting up with the slow start we had here. But I think we've covered a lot of ground, but I wanted to give you both uh, each uh, individually an opportunity to kind of speak your piece on Space Pirate Captain Harlock. Fume, as the new guest, love for you to go first. I mean, while I've got the floor here, I just want to give this quick little personal anecdote. Uh, the I've technically known about this anime ever since I was a child. And it's because oh. of Gumby. Do you guys know what that is? Am I speaking? Yes. Oh, Gumby is, of course. <laughs> so, well, well, I should say this. I was born in 1998. So, like, you know, obviously all this was way before my time. But my dad was a huge VHS collector. And he had a... By the way, you just made John and I feel really fucking old. So thank you very oh, much. I, I apologize. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, yeah, my dad, he was a huge VHS collector back in, like, the 80s. and. He had a bunch of VHS tapes of Gumby, and I remember on one of them, at the end of the program, it just had all of these trailers at the end, and one of them was for Captain Harlock. But the problem... Wow. Because it was family home entertainment, and they distributed, you know, the original VHS release. But the problem with that quote-unquote trailer is it was just the intro, and the intro to the dub, which was a a disco song. Oh, yeah, let me be your captain. Exactly. (laughs) It's so good. But there's no logo or anything or text on the screen that says what the show is. And they know Captain Harlock in the theme song. So for years, like I sort of knew about this and I always wanted to watch it because I thought it looked cool, but I never knew what it was called. Like I tried searching things like uh, Take to the Sky and stuff like that. Oh, my God. Uh, It it wasn't until like uh, I think 2015 was when I rediscovered it. I can't remember how and realize Did you see a corn pone do you happen to see a corn pone flicks video on youtube by any chance because because uh, before me i think he's he did one of the best jobs in english in the english-speaking community of documenting it i i think what it was is i was just browsing like it might have been Crunchyroll or funimation at the time and back when funimation had a streaming service i mean they don't exist anymore mm-hmm. but uh they had that anime there because i was just looking okay. up old anime and uh it was just there, and I was like, holy shit, this is that Eureka. anime. Uh, <laughs> but like I said, it was just this super long search because they, you know, if you want to sell something, you should probably put up a logo, yeah, some kind of text or something. But no, it was literally just <laughs> the intro with no text. And it's like, well, what the fuck is this? So it had been, Get ready. This, it had been this huge, like, mystery to me for a long time. No, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, I finally watched it. Uh, I don't think I finished it when I started watching it in 2015. I think I got up to like maybe episode 30 or something. So uh, mm-hmm. technically this most recent rewatch I've done is my first time completing it. So it just kind of feels like this uh, long quest of mine has finally been completed, so to speak. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's pretty much my first, uh, I guess, Liege verse property that I've ever seen. I mean, I've seen the Galaxy Express movie, but uh you know, mm-hmm. other than that, this is sort of my introduction to the Liege verse. And, you know, I'm definitely intrigued to check out some more. I I had started yes. watching the Galaxy Express TV series. I never got too far into it, but I definitely want to pick up the pace on that and check out mm-hmm. some other stuff. It's just uh, dig deep. You know, it, it's got its it's got its qualms. It's got its issues and some yeah. confusing aspects to it. But I think it definitely overall holds up i mean you could tell it was done in the 70s but i mean i i never thought that was a a hindrance to my enjoyment i just i thought it was just oozing with style and the characters are all Mm -hmm. really enjoyable how they interact with each other it's just uh you know I, i have really overall nothing but positive things to say about it so i would certainly recommend anyone check it out if they haven't seen it Awesome. Yeah, I it always makes me like as it being my mission (laughs) 
is to spread the Liege verse, especially amongst English speaking audiences. And if this little exercise we all did uh, has inspired you to do that, I'm so happy. And you're always welcome to come by. If you don't go on Facebook.com slash Liegeverse, you're always free to hit me up if you got a question or confusion about the Liegeverse. I'm so happy to hear all of that. So thank you again, Fumekam. Absolutely. John. And John, I'm sorry if I aged you, overaged you. Are you an 80s baby? Uh, I am not. I am, I am born in 1993. Okay. 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 I had a feeling you were an 80s baby, but I miss it. I'm the old one here. I'm ancient. So I'm the only old as fuck one. Uh, I apologize for grouping you with me. Uh, no, no, but I'm old. listen, I'm almost thirty, so <laughs> you're getting there. You're getting there. Basically, a dinosaur. <laughs> but yeah, please share with us your your kind of final thoughts here. Before I say anything about Harlock, I do want to say that I have very fond memories of catching those anime promos at the end of VHS tapes. I was actually just telling a friend about my weird obsession with the Ranma trailer that used to be mm. at the end of Pioneer tapes. So oh, like Pioneer. Yeah. The Pokemon tapes. Yes. Pioneer oh, just had okay. all the Pokemon tapes. And at the end of the Pokemon tapes, after the Poke Rap, it it like a rocks, a J-Rock song would come up and it'd be like, dan it dan it and it'd start playing clips of Ranma. And it'd be like, it was a typical day at the Tendo training hall. And maybe that's why I saw a whole like series of Ranma VHSs at Goodwill one time. Maybe somebody was like watching Pokemon and they were like, I got to get every one of these. Uh, yeah, sorry, go it's, on. it's hilarious because it's such a fucking rocking trailer. It's like, yeah. get your energy pumping. You're so into it. And then they would usually follow it up with like the dog of Flanders. And it's like, boo. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the new adventures of Kimbo, the white lion. Yes. Uh, yes. That, exactly. Ah, uh, super well. <laughs> Kimba, not Simba. Kimba. Anyways. Um, well, yeah, please. That, that, that's my nostalgia for VHS tape anime trailers. But with Harlock, I'm noticing as I get older. Uh, that Harlock mentality, especially the way he words it in the first episode where he talks about how it is the complacency of humanity that is preventing human evolution. And that's something that needs that's that's the problem. It's like it's it doesn't matter that they're happy and they're comfortable is that they're not pushing themselves and they're letting themselves stagnate. And that's something that I feel on a on a personal level is a problem. Mm-hmm. I, I noticed with a lot of people is allowing themselves to stagnate. And that's something I always try to push people to do to go out of their comfort zone. I always tell them a a personal story of mine where I was always the kind of person that, you know, I didn't like to leave home. I was, I couldn't, couldn't even go to summer camp because I was always afraid of leaving home and trying new things. And I, by some crazy miracle or I I managed to save, save up enough money. And, And this is a guy who was afraid to apply to college because I was like, what if I have to sleep away and I am away from home? At 19 years old, I took $400 and moved out of state to live oh, wow. completely on my own. In a, it, it, I moved from the Bronx to middle of nowhere, Ohio, and just like <laughs> uprooted myself and st- I'd started like my life over pretty much. And mm-hmm. it's it's been incredible. I've I, I've loved the freedom, the agency. I'm uh you know I'm I'm able to support myself, and it's helped. It's I've grown so much more as a person just by doing that by getting out of my comfort zone. And that was what I took from Harlock was that the pushing push people out of their comfort zone to do new things. And that's how people grow. Um, and mm-hmm. that's like a really important message. And also the government is constantly lying to you, even when they say <laughs> they have their best interest in mind ever. It, it doesn't matter what side you're on. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody, everybody's got those feels. I wouldn't want to interrupt you too much, but, I will say in terms of this, this, your story and how it lines up with Harlock, I mean, that's so clear. It's the hero's journey, right? It's the leaving of the home front. And, and we talked about like the stagnancy, uh, the stagnancy, the stagnant uh, nature of humanity at that point. And, you know, your hometown, I recently moved to huge move. Uh, mine may be a little later in life than yours, but it was still it, all those things you talked about are the same. And I think it's because, I mean, your hometown doesn't necessarily have your back for, I think, at least most people. Right. It's and that's Harlock. He may have a love for his hometown, but 
that doesn't mean the people in his hometown have a love for him. And that can cause a lot of resentment and bitterness and loneliness, but it also opens the door to finding a new family, finding new opportunities, finding new joy and new agency and freedom. I mean, did you did you have anything else you wanted to wrap up with? No, no, that was entirely. Yeah. And even the thing about even found family, because like mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I, I live in a house with my best friend and we produce stuff together and I, I started awesome. putting them in videos and stuff. And it's like these, these aren't people who like these are literally just people I've found. I've stumbled across. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and they've been a bigger part of my life than a lot of people in my actual family. Yes, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it, it breaks tradition. It breaks norm. But. It can be it can be super real in in that way. I'll I'll wrap up a little bit here. I will say for me and Captain Harlock, particularly space pirate Captain Harlock, for somebody that's run been running a Liegeverse page for the last couple of years, uh, not having finished this, I did uh, start it and try to finish it many times. Like I said, I'm a dub guy, not a sub guy. I get distracted way too easily. Uh, I had to basically the, I did the watch alongs on Twitch basically by myself because I had to force myself right somehow and putting a camera on me and broadcasting it was the only way to get it done. So this series was definitely a challenge for me because I think a lot of the other Liege verse shines so much brighter and I've seen so much of it. But the seminal nature of this the importance of it as a touchstone for the rest of the Liege verse proper to be animated. I can't argue with it. I think it's so important and the highs are high and the characters are great and I can't not like it. I wouldn't put it as S tier, but I'm glad I watched it. I'm glad I watched it. There's no regret. I didn't waste my time in any way, shape or form, even if it was hard to put the time in. Excellent series. And I hope to talk about uh, a lot of other, you know, Fume Kamiya saying you, you might want to check out some other Liegeverse stuff. Love to have you back to talk about more uh, Liegeverse. And of course, uh, John, you're always welcome back. As yeah, well. I, I desperately need to watch Yamato. Um, so, yes, yes. Well, that may be another sin of mine, though. I watched the whole reboot, at least. So I know what's going on. And I watched the first season of Star Blazers. But then there's the dub issue, right? So. That's going to be another battle for me. Star Blazers dub is relatively accurate. Is that true? Uh, well, they call sake spring water, but they have to cover some things up. They move some things around. Overall, I think the impression of Yamato for its time and the people who watched it is so potent that I don't think any old head really cares too much (laughs) about the localization. Like they find it charming. But you'd have to ask, I don't know, you'd have to ask Tim Eldred more about that. Maybe we should do a Yamato episode. I mean, maybe we should. Maybe we could do the movies, too, which are a little, the older movies are cut up of the series for the most part. I'll wrap it up. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for watching another episode of the Free Arcadia podcast. I'm hoping to do some greater distribution in the near future if I can get episode count back up again. So. That's the goal here. Hopefully we'll we'll be doing this a lot more. So stay tuned. Uh, Facebook.com slash Liegeverse. You can check out Liegeverse. We're a strong growing community. I would say we're probably the largest English speaking Liegeverse community on earth. Join us there and hope to see you in the future. Fumekam is, is our new guest. Uh, would you like to throw in any plugs here at the end? If you guys just want to check out my YouTube channel, it's Fumekam. Uh, I'm planning on being a little more active here as we approach the end of the year i've uh i've actually got a captain harlock video on the way i uh, awesome i just received something very interesting from japan but i'll kind of hold off on talking about it till i get this video out and uh i do video game streams uh, i try to do them every weekend over on my twitch channel which again is just twitch.tv slash fumecom and and i have a twitter where i just post insane ramblings and, <laughs> and shit posts and stuff like that which it's not necessary for anyone to follow that. if you want to know the real yeah if you want to know the real fumecom that that's on twitter but uh otherwise I, that your twitch streams were great i loved watching you finish up uh, mega man legends oh, thank so you. 
yeah, that was that was cool. And uh, let me know if you need any help with that Harlog video, man. I'm I'm always here for that. Or, or just let me know when it's about to go live. I'm excited. Oh, so. absolutely. And Mercury Falcon, any plugs you'd like to throw in here at the end? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll plug my uh, my YouTube channel, youtubecom slash Falcon. Um, you'll find me. Um, I also recently wrote an article on the website Zimmerit, uh, common writer behind the mask. I did. Uh, I translated a bunch of uh, primary sources about the creation of Common Rider. So most in-depth information that I think we've seen in the English language, a lot of stuff from people who worked on the show directly, Toru Hirayama specifically, as well as a couple of Ishinomori art books that weren't written by him, by pe- but people who worked with him adjacent, you know. So probably the best sources on that subject. I'm really proud of it. It's gotten a lot of positive feedback. Check it out. Also, Working on a video right now about the evolution of super robots in the 70s. So Harlock kind of fits in. It kind of diverged from that path. But sci-fi, mm-hmm. 70s, Toei hits a couple. Of Dan videos, Guard. So. Dan Guard Ace, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I was going to talk about I was going to ask you about Dan Guard Ace. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll ask you now. I um, I know that Leiji Matsumoto didn't like giant robot anime. I don't know if he didn't like it, but I know that I don't think it got him... I don't think it got him off, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And I know that because um, part of the thing I'm writing is Toei had a falling out with Go Nagai over some, you know, royalties and and some business politics mostly. Um, and they brought in Leiji Matsumoto, I know, to be like, you're going to be our new manga guy who's mm-hmm. like, you're the name we slap on the robot show. And yeah. I wondered if maybe Leiji Matsumoto agreed to that to kind of grease the wheels on doing manga adaptations of his other stuff you are a thousand percent correct uh verified by darren john ashmore have you happened to seen the uh, life and times of lazy matsumoto episode we did no i didn't give that a watch darren john ashmore is uh the uh the gringo by lazy matsumoto's side for lack of better words he's probably the closest englishman proper englishman to lazy matsumoto that i know of unless there's another one i don't know about at least at this point. And he uh, worked on the Leiji Matsumoto uh, essays on the manga and anime legend, which came out, which is like the first uh, biographical book on Leiji Matsumoto in English. Uh, So all things to check out. Oh, you got a Patreon with a lot of cool stuff on it too, right? Like a people, you've got like translations and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Whenever I commission translations, I always post it. Um, five dollar tier gets you access to all the stuff I tra- I get translated. It also gets you into the Discord where you can see me rambling about. Do you think the thesis of this video is good? And then people just go, I don't know, just make the video. And I'm like, No, I need an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The general public doesn't know what to tell you to make. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, if you ever asked them, would you rather see this or this? The answer is always both. So it's- yeah, yes, both. Absolutely both. So uh, yeah, I think. I think that's it. I appreciate everybody in chat, everybody who swung by. I appreciate these two very fine gentlemen for bringing some people over to my my little dinky channel over here. And I'm so privileged and blessed to get to speak with both of you about this creator that I love and this anime that's so cool. So, yeah, thanks again. Uh, you guys aren't on camera, so so I'll give the heart. What is it? It's, uh, oh, God, what hand is it? I think it might be his left. I'll give you the salute. Have a good one. See you guys. All right. See you.